Brooklyn, New York. A young man, 18 years old, sits next to his living room window. He's gazing distantly out towards the city streets, watching as strangers walk by. He has much on his mind and little of it good. A woman close to his age, older by a margin, not great enough to mark a difference to the passive viewer, enters. He looks up briefly, sadness apparent in his eyes as she approaches to join him. T? A demure voice asks. Not right now. Thank you, though. He replies, before returning to stare vacantly at the pedestrians beyond the glass. Last night was difficult, I know, but you must continue doing what it is that you've always done. The strength that carried you through 2015, the willpower that brought you from Mandeville to this point in your... No. Our lives. That has to be your focal point. Don't throw it all away. You've dealt with much worse. The man looks to his companion with gratitude in his eyes. Her words are his stalwart comfort. I just... miss him so much. The woman's eyes remain fixed, waiting. Lou, I'm waiting, she says, this time with a bit of sarcasm in her voice. A smile was threatening to form the corners of her mouth, which would spell disaster at this exact moment. After a moment of almost palpable effort, Lou Woods relieves a harsh sigh, and his mask of misery was quickly replaced with a brief smile of his own. Shit, sorry, Jess. I just can't cry on command. I told you this before you wrote this out. Jessica Lum, who was both Lou's girlfriend and self-appointed director of public relations, allowed herself to chuckle a bit as well. Looks like we're gonna have to break out the stage tears again. Oh, Jess, you know I hate those damn things. Oily is all hell, and I think they clogged my pores last time. I'm not too old for pimples yet. Do you really want that shit on your YouTube thumbnail? Well, Lou, had that bitch down in Mandeville not tanked our spotlight last night on Jack Elder, we likely would be done with his online diary crap. Can't believe Elder's producers let that bullshit happen. I mean, this was your moment. Yeah, I know. Freaking Jane Alabama, whatever her name is. And why the hell did she get to call in and, and cowboy the whole damn interview? Her name is Arkansas. I've been doing my research since last night. Remember that rich guy that was murdered in Mandeville a while back? That was her daddy. I guess since then, the girl's just been, I don't know, some, some sort of mission to expose the town. She's recently appeared on some B-rate shit show called Cult Hunters. After her episode was filmed, the actors played the roles of her and your brother, and they were found murdered. It's all the buzz down there. You really should start watching the news, Lou. Jess. The day I start reading the paper or watching the news is the day I want you to shoot me in the face with a flare gun. Because that's the day I start turning into my dad. Death will be a welcomed mercy to avoid that fate. But Lou, if I shoot you with a flare, you'll turn into your brother. Lou the killer. Just doesn't have the same ring to it. So you're saying that Jeff the Killer does? Christ. Only my big brother could become an infamous serial killer and come out sounding like a... Fuck, I don't even know. If he danced like Michael, he could be Jeff the Thriller, Jessica announced, starting a routine that she and Lou came up with right after they started dating. Yeah, and if he calls you over to watch Netflix, he'd be called Jeff the Chiller. If he holds up the moral aptitude of a community, he'll be Jeff the Pillar. Damn, woman, why are you so good at this? Okay, if he was a pilgrim, he'd be Jeff the Miller. Weak. If he worked for the IRS, he'd be Jeff the Biller. Okay. If he if he was a shitty writer who couldn't stay away from purple prose, he'd be Jeff the Filler. Oh, Lou, you really tried there. If he rolled a natural 20 on a saving throw to avoid being hypnotized by an evil wizard, he'd be Jeff the Willer. I challenge. Willer is not a word, he demanded. Well, sweetie, I hate to break it to you, but Lou is not a name. Yet, you're still here. Challenge overturned. <sighs> Damn, Jess. You had balls. By the end of their game, both Lou Woods and Jessica Lum were laughing in long, earnest bouts that required breaks to catch their breath. The aggravation of Jane Arkansas's telephonic intrusion from her call on Lou's live interview with Jack Elder the night before was starting to fade a bit. He was still annoyed over it, maybe even downright pissed, but there would be other chances. Until then, he still had his book deal, his check from appearing on Elder's show, 
whatever publicity would come with it. Even if the world was more interested in some girl from Mandeville and her sob story, he was still the brother of Jeff the Killer. His check was written in cash the moment Jeff murdered their parents. Jane Alabama, or whatever her name was, could come and lap up the crumbs if she wanted to. There was only one Lou Woods, and he was determined to ride that name straight into celebrity status. On the subject of celebrities, Lou's sit-down with Elder had sported not only the aggravation of Jane calling in, ranting about the cover-up in Mandeville, the murder of two actors working with cult hunters, and about a million other portals into insanity, but he'd also been stood up by Randy Hayden, who was scheduled to be a surprise guest on the show. The idea had been cleared with Lou beforehand, as Elder didn't want his program to devolve into an afternoon talk show of drama and chair-throwing, and the youngest brother, Woods, had all been on board. Elder had teased dragging Lou through the painful memories of the fight at Friendly Video, a concept that was turning into his version of the OK Corral, while his guest sat there in feigned anger. Elder would lead into something along the lines of, If Randy was here today, would you face him? Lou fist-balled, eyes filled with stoic courage, yet body language that spoke only of chaos would nod once, hopefully, producing the elusive tear. Elder would then announce, Well, here he is. At this point, Randy would nervously walk onto the stage, hat in hand, shoulders shrugged, as he finally faced one of his victims in person. They would talk, they would tackle hard and emotional facets of their past, and in the end, the hug seen round the world. Forgiveness from Lou. Healing from Randy. It would have been a ratings bonanza. However, Randy never showed. Though Lou hadn't spoken to him personally, Elder's production team had assured all the audience that the legendary bully from Mandeville, son of tyrannical swindler Maxwell Hayden, wielder of the fateful flare gun, would indeed be present for duty when Elder called his name. That didn't happen. Lou had been informed before filming began that Randy simply fell off the face of the earth as far as the newsroom production staff could tell. Phone calls and voicemails went unanswered. Emails were ignored. Twitter messages fell on blind eyes, and in the end, and ran. Randy Hayden was a no-show. Lou was furious. But thankfully, his ever-faithful friend, lover and keeper of secrets, although many she filmed, Jessica Lum had managed to calm him down and get him back on track. This sucks, Lou, but it's more camera time for you, okay? It's not like we're letting any of your fans down. You never promised them a meeting with Randy. It was supposed to be a surprise, so no PR damage done. Plus, if Randy does pop back up, this may get you another spot on Newsroom. Or maybe, maybe The View or Dr. Phil. Now who the fuck cares as long as it's camera time for you? Now go out there and knock him deader than your brother on a flare gun fueled My Mommy Didn't Love Me murder spree. She always knew what to say. Jane had been a curveball though that even the crafty Jessica had not seen coming. The show was going alright. It was being broadcast live and it was obvious to Jessica that Elder was throwing Lou too many softball questions. People liked the broken Lou. The damaged Lou, and the victim of the victim Lou. All of that was fine and dandy, but Elder was lingering too much on the parts of the story that everyone already knew. Anyone that picked up Monica Davenport's Jeff tapes could tell you about the emotional, neglectful parents. Anyone who watched Randy Hayden spill his guts to Leslie Matthews could tell you about the affluent bullies and the police force that refused to make a move against them or their families. She wanted Elder to dig into Lou's life after 2015, his long road to recovery while being bullied at Texas public schools after he was shuttled off to live with extended family, his grit to finding the strength to pour his pain into pages of his best-selling book, and of course, his future plans in New York. Before Elder could eventually, if he ever would have, shift the interview into new territory though, Jane Arkansas had called in. She'd ranted about the issues that was still going on down in Mandeville. The death of some police officer with a goofy-sounding name. Jessica couldn't even remember it, but she recalled that it rhymed. 
the death of two bit part actors who appeared in an even more bit part cable television program hosted by king of all bit parts, Derek I Crashed a Boat Reynolds, and a slew of other horror stories suddenly took over the entire show. Jessica held back rage as she watched Lou, who also appeared to be holding back the urge to scream, sit across from Elder while this woman from Mandeville hijacked the entire damn episode. Suddenly, it was as if she was being interviewed over the phone by Elder as Lou only sat and tried to nod here and there, although he actually hadn't been keeping up with any of the grisly little scenarios that had been, and according to Jane, still were unfolding in his former little suburb, as if he could contribute to the conversation. Jessica timed it, and Jane's little phone call ate up what equated to a whopping 37% of the entire hour-long presentation. In the end, Elder likely put her on the line with his scheduling people to try to get her spot on the show. Jessica was not happy. Get this, Lou, she told him afterwards, as they both turned to better living through chemistry to ease their angst at the whole debacle. Turns out that the cable network that carries Cult Hunters isn't going to air that episode now, at least not until some time passes and the two actors are buried and mourned. Does this little Jane bitch really think she's fooling anyone? Her opportunity at the limelight was cancelled, so she had to steal yours. Fucking asshole. This is why girls hate each other. Lou, who had been using a credit card to mill through a white powder, A powder that not only decorated a portion of his living room table, but also was dotted faintly above his upper lip and right below his nose, nodded with an accompanying grunt of agreement. Jess continued, According to the internet, she didn't even move to Mandeville until after you were out in Texas living with relatives. Her dad apparently pissed off some fucking idiot who liked to dress up as your brother. Post flair versions, of course. Of course, Lou agreed. Anyway, she moved into your old house. How do you like that? Said fucking idiot then came over and burned the damn place down with, going by the internet at least, the intention of cooking Miss Arkansas inside. She'd been tied to a chair. Her lawyer rescued her at the last minute, apparently shooting the attacker, another Jeff clone, in the leg. He escaped in the chaos, but little Jamie was rescued and got to steal your 15 minutes of fame as a parting gift. After a loud snorting session followed by a loud breath of euphoric satisfaction, Lou joined the conversation. Whatever, it's annoying, but honestly, that interview was over for me as soon as Randy bailed. What a dick. Guy shoots my brother with a flare gun, then can't even have the decency to repay me with some top-notch ratings. Lou's compass of success had not always pointed so diligently to the north, however. His teenage years after 2015 were not entirely pleasant. As he began to reflect, Jessica interrupted him as she began to turn off the cameras that she had set up to film a testimonial from Lou concerning his feelings after appearing on Jack Elder. He did not mention Randy or Jane during this video. Instead, he was to lament on the typical sad sack style that he employed when making most of his videos for Jess. On tape, he was the sad, broken brother the humbled survivor, grieving orphan, and the ultimate beacon of sympathy. In reality, Lou Woods wanted his share of the profit from the crap his brother had heaped onto him four years ago. Lou had asked for none of this, yet it'd be delivered to him in the form of two slaughtered parents left to rot in a bedroom just a few yards down the hall from his own. Jeff had left, and in his wake was ruination. Lou had to live with it, and he decided some time ago that if he had to live as the brother of Jeff the Killer, he'd be damn sure to do it his way. Babe, I'm gonna get some stage tears. Zits or not, you gotta cry on this video. That's your money shot, kid. He looked up at his girlfriend as she was making her way to the door. Okay, get food while you're out. If I have to stop and get you food, your ass better be camera ready when I get back. Real emotion, Lou. She left. Lou thought about what she'd said. Real emotions. He used to have those. 
Now that he had the house to himself, he decided to continue his reminiscing. He walked into the small bedroom that he and Jessica shared and opened up the case that held each and every video she'd ever shot concerning the past, present, and future of Lou Woods. Jessica had labeled them religiously. They were perfectly ordered. Lou found the video that he wanted immediately. The first. The story of what happened after Jeff Woods bid his brother farewell and vanished into the night. He returned to his living room and loaded the tape. He knew Jess would be out for a while. She was a slow shopper. He'd have time to watch his tape without interruption. He picked up the remote. And he pressed play. Lou sat back and listened as his own voice and words washed over him. Jessica asked question after question, and as Lou heard himself responding, his mind began to paint a picture. The pictures began to move, and before long, the young brother of Jeff the Killer was enjoying a movie in his mind. The plot being moved along by his own retelling. He allowed his eyes to close so that he could watch the movie without any real-world distractions. Soon enough, his mind's eye took him back to Mandeville. Back to 2015. And the horror that became his life for quite some time. Lou Woods had been moved first to his Aunt Marcy's home in Abita Springs. He'd left her home less than 48 hours prior to the events that would change his remaining childhood years forever. He'd been sent to his aunt's as a punishment by his now-deceased parents for the fight between Jeff and Randy Hayden's friends, and believed that he'd been forced to remain there until the start of the second year. However, a careless act of stupidity with a loaded flare gun changed all of that. His mother informed her sister that her oldest son was lying in a hospital bed after an accident at a friend's house. Lou still remembered hearing his mom refer to Randy as a friend, and even until this day, it still angered him. That was just Sheila Woods for you, though. Some punk kid shoots her son with a flare gun, and she still finds a way to put a community-friendly spin on the situation. Marcy had driven Lou the short distance from Alberta Springs to Mandeville, but never wavered in complaining about the burden the task was placing on her. She repeated to her 14-year-old nephew several times that her car was old and she didn't like taking it so far from home. It was as if Marcy didn't care that her other nephew was in the hospital, with severe burns to his face. She sighed, loudly, each time that she had to stop for a red light. She made no effort to expedite their trip to the hospital, despite the fact that Lou was in full-blown panic. After all, Jeff the Killer had yet to be born. The teenager in the emergency room was just Jeff, still Lou's big brother and best friend. Once they finally did arrive, Lou immediately bolted from the car. He still recalled seeing Jeff lying in the bed with his face wrapped and IVs hooked to his arm. Marcy caught up eventually, and she and her sister began to talk in hushed tones. Matt Woods only sat and stared at his son. Lou saw that his eyes were red. His father had cried. And in the moment, Lou allowed himself to pretend to be a child with normal parents. He walked over to his father, who hugged him firmly. Lou, Jeff's gonna be okay, I promise. EMTs assured us that the injuries to his face are not life-threatening. What happened, Dad? We don't know yet, but... Sheila Woods interrupted. We know. Jeff was playing with a flare gun, showing off for his friends. Lou could see that his mother had also shed tears, but he didn't feel the same level of empathy. He had a theory that Sheila's tears were more likely caused from the embarrassment of having her son injure himself. She was likely far more concerned about being labeled a bad mother than having her firstborn in the care of the ER. Then it dawned on him. What friends? He and Jeff hadn't made any friends since moving to Mandeville. The only other kids they'd met had been Randy, Keith, and Troy. And they most certainly were not friends. Lou briefly pondered how absurd it would be if their mother had actually forced Jeff to go and hang out with those assholes from the video store parking lot. 
After finding out that Randy's father was in charge of the branch that his dad worked for, it would almost seem possible. Lou dismissed it, though, believing that such an act was far too outrageous for even his parents to come up with. And then... Sheila told him. It was Randy Hayden along with two of his friends. Those boys tried to talk Jeff into putting that flare gun away. I mean, why would he be so... Lou felt his own brand of anger growing, although his was not laced with the same shades of blooming insanity that Jeff's had recently become. Despite his age, Lou was no fool when it came to the methods and thinking of his mother and father. He couldn't imagine a scenario in which Jeff and Randy's group would become friends so quickly, although he did have to admit that it was possible. Still, something in his mother's tone, the way she defended the three pieces of shit that accosted her child barely a week ago, Something was there that Lou didn't like or trust. Why was Jeff hanging out with Randy? Lou let it be, Matt stated patiently. No, Dad. What really happened over there? I told you what happened, Lou, Sheila snapped. Let's take a walk, son, Matt said, and led Lou out into the hallway. Dad, I know you work for Hayden. I know our fight caused you some... some problems, maybe, but... But why was Lou there? Is mom telling the truth? Lou was waiting for his father's typical reaction. Stress, annoyance, and dismissal. So when his father began to engage his son's concerns, Lou was almost as shocked as when he'd first seen Jeff's condition. They continued to walk as Matt spoke. Lou... We're not going to know what really happened in that garage today until until Jeff wakes up and gives us his side of the story. They say that Jeff shot himself in the face out of negligence, but that was based only on the information given by these little rich assholes. I also couldn't help but notice that the same cop, Williamson, who came to our house last week was also investigating this incident. That cop's covering for Randy and his friends. I know, son. Believe me, it was almost impossible for me to stand there and listen to him scold you and Jeff about not locking up your bikes as if that was justification for them to ride on them. Dad, if you know all of this, then why did you let Mom send me to Marcy's? And you, you still haven't told me why Jeff was hanging out with Randy today. Were they really friends all of a sudden? Or was there something else? Jeff and Randy weren't friends. Your mom and his mom were trying to smooth things over and... A pause from Matt Woods. No, I won't lie. Your mom wanted Jeff and Randy to get along because the Haydens are important people in this town. I had already squared things away with Max Hayden for the most part. The idea of the kids trying to make friends... That came from your Sheila. Why does mom care so much about this shit? Uh, I'm sorry, crap. No, Luke. Shit is exactly what those kids are. Their families, wealth, the success that came from the parents they were just lucky enough to be born from. Well, that becomes their shield and sword. It protects them. Like with Williamson. And it could be used as a weapon, too. I've dealt with people like Hayden all my life. I worked my ass off to climb the damn corporate ladder, having to bow down to executives who likely produce the majority of Randys in the world. I hated it. Because, because Lou, no matter how many times you write the reports that make them look good to their bosses, no matter how many times you come in early so they can have hot coffee waiting, no matter how many times you kiss the goddamn ring, you're always trash to them. Just like me and Jeff are to Randy, Keith, and Troy. No. No, you are not. You and Jeff are better now than those little fucks will be in their entire life. I just wanted to make sure that you and Jeff never had to be like me, rolling away in a cubicle, complimenting some jackass's tie, and laughing at his jokes, all in the name of making a living. But Christ, Lou. I fucked this up royally, didn't I? I just don't understand why you and Mom have to act like you do. Why couldn't you have just stood up for us with Williamson? 
Why can't you stand up now? It's because I love Sheila so much. And one day you'll see what it's like when you're married. Your mother's put up with a lot from me over the years as well. I've, I've made mistakes in the past. She's chosen to forgive them. And this, this town, this illusion of status, it gives her something that I think I, I may have taken away years ago. Dad, what? It's not for you to know, Lou, but as much as I love your mother, I can't ignore the fact that my son is in the hospital because of some shithead kids. I trust me, Lou. Once we find out from Jeff's side of the story, if it turns out Randy and his friends did this, I won't have to worry about working for Max Hayden any longer because I'll put those kids' heads through a fucking wall. Despite the mental trauma that Lou felt he was drowning in, his father's words brought a genuine smile to his face. His father continued. Now listen, son. Don't take any of this to your mom. She's going to have to deal with this her own way. And you already know what that way is likely going to be. I'm going to support her too. She has to go through the emotional distress of having an injured child. She, she may not show it in the best of ways, but she loves you both very much. She has her own cross to bear, and I hope one day you can understand that. I hope you won't hate her. Okay, Dad. I won't hassle, Mom. Good boy. Thank you. Look. Look, I'll... I'll take care of Sheila for the next few days if you agree to take care of Jeff. He's gonna need a lot of emotional support, and I know having to rebuild some trust with him, and, and I will. But in the meantime, he's going to expect you to be his shoulder to lean on. Can you do that for me, Lou? Of course, Dad. And thank you for talking to me, for being honest about this. I don't care what kind of house we live in or how much money that you make. I just want my dad. And mom, too. You'll have us both. Once Jeff recovers, I'm going to take some time off work and maybe we can go camping or something. In that moment, Lou felt joy and peace come over him that he hadn't felt in ages. He felt like he was reunited with his father. He believed in his heart, without doubt, that things were going to get better now. He was wrong. Lou discovered his parents' murder on what would have otherwise been a rather typical late summer morning. The police were called. Reports were filed. Questions were asked. And a search was formed for Jeff. At the time, the assumption was that he was kidnapped by whoever murdered Matthew and Sheila. Crime scene investigations did their job, and as more evidence was compiled from the bloodbath left in the master bedroom, Lou couldn't help but notice the adults were telling him less and less. Something was going on that they didn't want him to know about. Lou was temporarily living with his Aunt Marcy, who, by the grace of God above, had rediscovered her ability to express compassion and empathy. He stayed secluded as much as possible, and said very little. He was being interviewed almost daily by police detectives, and based on their questions, he was starting to piece the rest of the puzzle together. So, you recall your brother waking up on the night of your parents' murder, correct? Asked the senior investigator for the Mandeville police. His name was Detective Mitchell Hardy. Yeah. It was his first night back from the hospital. He was acting strange most of the evening, but he just... Well, he'd just been through all the... You know... Injuries, so I sort of... Lou replied. I understand that. He's been through a lot of traumas, right? So you mentioned that you tried to bring his behavior up to your parents earlier that evening. So that Jeff was making you nervous, is that correct? I mean... He kept... Looking at his face and saying weird stuff, I thought he might be depressed. My parents, they... They were tired, though, and they didn't want to talk. So tell me again what he said to you the last time you spoke. He... He said that I was free now. That I'd understand in the morning. Oh man, do you, do you guys think that... 
You guys really think, Jeff? What I think, Lou, is that you lived through something really horrible. And you're being quite brave in helping us. You're a very strong young man. This investigation is just starting, so we have to explore every possible avenue. No one is accusing your brother of anything. We can't ignore evidence. Do you understand that, Lou? Y yes, sir, Detective Hardy. Can I ask you a question? Certainly. Have you spoken to Randy Hayden? Or any of his friends from the day of the flare injury? About your parents? No. Do you believe they have information? I, th I think... I think they're the ones that shot Jeff with the flare gun. That cop, Williamson, he was there and... Hardy interrupted. Lou, I think right now we need to focus on your parents and finding your brother. I'm not just concerned with questioning him about the night of the murders, but I'm also concerned for his health. He's had quite a bad burn on his face, so without proper care, he could get an infection and get sick, possibly even die. I, I know, I just... I, I want to find him too. Good. So think really hard, Lou. I know you and Jeff weren't living in Mandible for long, but is there anywhere you can think of where he would be hiding out? Do you guys have a hangout, you know, like a clubhouse or something? For a moment, Lou did have an idea. A place that he and Jeff discovered on the day they encountered Randy in the parking lot. However, Hardy was giving off a vibe now that Lou couldn't quite describe. But he certainly didn't care for. Perhaps it was because Hardy had started the interview on friend mode. Just another friendly officer coming by to try to help piece Lou's life back together. However, just now, below the officer friendly lurked something else. An agenda that made Lou fear for his brother's safety. Hardy wasn't interested in getting Jeff medical attention. Hardy was interested in arresting and interrogating him. He also couldn't miss the very intentional dodge thrown by Hardy when the question of Randy was asked. He decided at that moment to tell the detective nothing. I'm sorry, sir. I can't think of anywhere Jeff may have gone. I just really hope you find him. After a few more questions, the interview was concluded and Hardy left, promising he'd be back in touch with Lou soon. It was soon after that, Williamson, Keith, and Troy were murdered. Lou was moved from Alberta Springs within a matter of days. With the photograph of Jeff taken by Williamson's son released to the press, there was no longer any question that the oldest Woods brother was behind these killings. He was moved out to Texas, where some extended family lived. There, he was expected to start a new life, far away from his dead parents and insane big brother. Things, however, were far from ideal. At first, anyway. Jeff the Killer was becoming a national headline by this time, and despite moving to another state, Lou Woods was immediately identified by his peers at the school. They were not kind. Hey Lou, did your brother fuck your mom after he stabbed her to death? <laughs> Came an insult one long dreadful day, as the now orphan teenager tried to push through math class. The teacher, a man who appeared to have less spine than hair, looked up from his newspaper, saw the brewing tension, and pretended as though he heard nothing. For a moment, Lou was torn. Anger rose within him, but along with it came a sense of defeat. He wanted to say something, and had he still possessed the unwavering confidence that he'd possessed when Jeff was alive, when Jeff, his best friend instead of a national headline, perhaps would have. Of course, if Jeff was still the brother that he'd grown up with, chances are he wouldn't have to deal with some asshole kid taking cheap shots at his dead parents. Hey, pussy, I asked you a question, the antagonistic classmate called out. Lou saw this for what it was. The same song and dance, perhaps set to a slightly different tune, perhaps in a new venue, but in the end, the same as always. The kid antagonizing Lou was named Trace Duncan. However, he demanded to be called Logan, for whatever reason, most likely because he imagined himself like the character Wolverine from the comics. 
Trace fancied himself a real badass, and since Lou had shown up in the classroom, he no doubt considered his and attempted to assimilate into a world that Trace also, and without a doubt, considered his. He had made Lou his verbal punching bag. The jokes were always the same. Dead parents this, crazy brother that, necrophilia sprinkled in for added impact. The other kids in class would snicker and Lou would juggle his options in his mind each time. Lou thought, I could fight, sure. If Trace is half as tough as he talks, he might very well kick the shit out of me. If I fight him and win, he'll likely show up with friends. He won't take a loss. I could try to strike back with insults or jokes. If I had a single friend in this class or... If half the students went either scared of Trace or just glad that he'd found a target that wasn't one of them, I might get a laugh from them. Of course, I tried that with Randy and his friends back in Mandeville. Made some stupid joke about me and Jeff saving up allowance to go screw his mom, and yeah, because she was a prostitute, huh, that's the joke. All that did was accelerate the violence that might not have existed had we just picked up our bikes and walked away. Lou heard the familiar sound of notebook paper being ripped from the book, followed by it being balled up. He knew what was coming next. Pop. A ball of paper bounced off the back of Lou's head. So, now we move on to Act Two, Lou thought. The verbal jabs about my parents, the constant jokes about my brother, fucking them, and the, the class chestnut. Calling me a pussy didn't quite get me worked up, at least not visibly. So now our friend Trace, Logan Duncan, will begin the traditional tossing of the balled up sheets of paper. He'll keep doing this until the bell rings. All the giggles and glee of all those around him, our illustrious teacher, Mr. Falcone, will simply sit behind his desk and pretend to grade papers. Because Falcone is also afraid of the Logans of the world. I'm sure Falcone isn't scared that Logan will beat him up. Falcon's afraid that Logan will openly defy him in front of the class, make our adult supervisor appear weak, meaningless, impotent, perhaps. So what do I do, God? Do I sit here and wallow in torment as Trace, call me Logan Duncan, gets his jollies at my expense? And if so, Lord, what do I gain? My brother and I remained obedient as our parents took our words of violent peers and crooked cops, and look where that got us. So please... Dear God in heaven above, do stroke thy beard in my favor and tell me a screwed up kid has been cast from everything he's ever known what to do. Please. God chose to take the path so favored by the professional educator and the reader of newspapers, Mr. Michael Falcone, and remain the hell out of this mess. Finally, the bell rang and Trace, I've got a hard on for Wolverine Duncan along with his snickering bard of idiots, left the room. Lou, as he did each and every day since moving to Austin and starting school there, stayed in his seat. Mr. Woods, class is over. Please go to your next assigned classroom, spoke the teacher, proving that even he waited for the bullies to leave before moving. Mr. Falcone, did you not see all that? Trace, ridiculing my parents, calling me a pussy, throwing stuff, throwing shit at my head? You did the right thing, Lou. Playing into their antics doesn't help anything. I know I did the right thing. I wish you had. Falcone appeared to consider correcting his student as he slowly crept towards insolence, but perhaps being aware of what the 15-year-old standing before him had endured barely one year ago... He chose to gesture towards the hallway and remind Lou that he had other classes to attend. There would be no more class today, though. He decided he had enough of Austin public education for one day and chose to head to the office and call home sick. His family would know that he wasn't really ill, but they'd informed him several times that should things get difficult or should he start feeling overly stressed that he should call home any time and they would come and pick him up. For the first few months of the school year, Lou hadn't taken them up on that rather generous offer of rescue. But today, he decided he would. 
As he walked towards the principal's office, tucked away in the administrative annex, he let his head hang down as he continued to think about his current state of affairs. Falcone's just like Dad. He knows that the status quo is wrong, corrupt, vile. But he also knows that rocking the boat can be worse. Fucking Trace. Just another Randy. Well, I bet he has a really fat friend and a really skinny friend that follow him around and parrot whatever bullshit he throws around. This whole thing isn't unique at all. What happened in Mandeville, it's happening right here. Only thing that made the incident back home stand out was... Jeff. On some days, when Trace Duncan or some other mean-spirited schoolmate chose to make Lou the target of their fun, he'd realize that Jeff was a catalyst. A one-of-a-kind event that could happen in almost any walk of life, but rarely does. Bullies, negligent adults, corrupt officials, they're everywhere. Very few of them ever see what their actions can really produce. Jeff, though. He stood out from the typical victim of torment and abuse. Lou was convinced that no one believed that such a rage could exist within a young man like Jeff. A child who'd been raised with a good education, lots of outlets for these ever-growing connections to the world around him. Lou theorized that perhaps what transformed Jeff Woods, brother, teacher, and friend, into the depraved ghoul known as Jeff the Killer, was that those little fail-safes, those little switches that kick on in people's minds, like the ones that told Lou not to instigate Trace. Well, in the case of Jeff, those fail-safes simply failed. Jeff had described his anger as syrup, a metaphor that made Lou cringe a bit, but also hit home as accurate, if not perhaps a bit overused. It leaked in, probably a little at a time over the years, that Matt and Sheila ignored them, it got worse with the move to Mandeville, though, and Jeff didn't want to be there. Randy and his friends contributed a crack or two, and the outright cartoonish treachery of Officer Williamson added a few more. Their parents sending Lou away, not caring that Randy had started the whole fight, that perhaps allowed the crack to spread enough to spiderweb into each other, turning several small, most likely harmless breaks in the wall into large, deeper, and far more alarming holes in the armor. The flare gun, Jeff's face, and the emotional devastation of hearing the same parents that supported the criminally negligent police stylings of Williamson, the same mother that forced her son to try to engage with the very kid that kicked off the damn problems, and finally having to hear that his parents, even when he was lying in the hospital, chose to believe said lying asshole kids. Well, that shattered the wall. The failsafes were gone. Whatever was left of the old Jeff, the best friend and mentor, that was now floating in the same rage sea of madness, where the rage, the revenge, and the sweet syrup of sadistic bliss all met and became one. Lou began to realize that when a caterpillar goes into the cocoon, what comes out is not a new creature altogether. Whatever made up the caterpillar still exists within the moth. But the moth is now a composite of a lot of other factors that were perhaps locked up inside the caterpillar's genetic makeup, but kept dormant. Jeff was driven insane. Jeff was... complete. Lou whispered. Randy, our parents, Williamson, the disfigurement, it didn't create a new person. It simply... It unlocked too much. The reason that some people are sick fucks and others are good members of society, it's because only so much of our entire self can exist at once. When it all comes together, though... Uh, Woods, the male voice suddenly called from nearby, breaking loose concentration and bringing him crashing back into reality. It was the school's principal, Mr. Robinson. Yes, sir? He asked, walking over to the man. He really just wanted to sign out and go home, but he supposed that so long as he wasn't in the classroom, having paper balls thrown at his head, he could endure a few more minutes at school. Uh, I'm sorry, Woods. How do you say your first name? Is, is it pronounced Liu? This, similar to bullies and bastards, was another constant in Liu's life. 
He dealt with it since his first day of preschool and before Jeff decided to take a kitchen knife to their mother and father. He honestly believed it might be the biggest concern that he'd ever have to live with. He supposed that even if the world one day forgot about Jeff the Killer, he'd still have to explain the correct pronunciation of his name for the rest of his life. That's pronounced Lou, sir. Just spelled weird. Lou counted down the seconds in his mind until the next inevitable question comment would follow. I take it that you get some Asian ancestry. Not that I know of, sir. Just parents that wanted to reinvent the wheel when it came to naming, I think. Very good, then. Now, Lou, I'd like you to do me a favor. You have a new student here, her first day at this school, in fact, and I know you've got class, but I'd like you to show her around. You're pretty new yourself, so you can let her know what to expect as a fresh transfer. Mind doing that for me? He wanted to go home. But upon seeing the bright eyes and warm smile of the face of the young woman who stepped out of the office to greet him, Lou decided that perhaps he could tough out the remainder of the day. Lou, this is Vivian Alexander. She transferred here from another Austin high school in a different district. Vivian, this is Lou. He moved to Texas last year from New Orleans. Nice to meet you, Lou. I always wanted to visit New Orleans. Vivian was what Lou supposed was called a perky goth. Dark on the outside, cheery on the inside. Her clothes seemed more homemade than Hot Topic, which reminded him of some older goth kids that hung out in Jackson Square back in New Orleans. For a moment, he felt a pang of homesickness that he hadn't experienced in some time, maybe because she reminded him of days he and Jeff still lived in Walnut Square out in New Orleans East. Back in those days, he'd hop the public bus and head downtown. They'd sit around Jackson Square watching the artists and buskers do their thing. Painters would create quick but respectable portraits of tourists with money burning away in their pockets. The tarot card readers represented a strange and esoteric presence that always fascinated Lou. He could remember time after time asking if he could get his palm read. Jeff would always tell him no, it was a waste of money and a bunch of superstitious foolishness for drunk visitors to New Orleans. Still, though, Lou always swore that when he was old enough to come down to the square alone, he'd finally lay down some cash and see what the cards held in store for him. Vivian, uh, you'd, um, you'd fit in nice in New Orleans, Lou stammered. The principal returned to his office and Lou gestured for Viv to follow him as he tried his best to remember where everything was in a school that he himself was still a bit new to. They'd made it halfway down the first hall, when she spoke. Lou Woods, younger brother of Jeff Woods. I didn't think I'd meet anyone like this on my first day here. Lou waited for the snide comment, the fearful eyes, or perhaps even the pity. He found that not all children were as cruel-hearted as Logan. Some were worse, treating him like something to be feared and avoided. Others handled him like porcelain, as though the any mention of his past life in Louisiana at all would simply shatter him into dust. That's me. So if you go up this hall... Damn it. I'm sorry, Lou. That was a bitchy thing for me to say like that. I, I'll never know what it's like to go through what you did. Or at least, I hope I'll never know. Sort of get what it's like to be treated like an outcast, she said. She raised her arm and did a slight turn as if to punctuate her position with a visual demonstration. My dad's an artist, and he's come up with some pretty crazy exhibits. Kids at my last school happened upon one of his more ambitious showcases, and well, let's just say I, it got so bad for me that I had to switch schools. What was it? Lou asked. He's really into gore, like that's his forte, you could say. He created a really bloody scene, fake blood of course, but... Oh god, I'm so stupid, Lou, I'm so sorry. What's the matter? It's just I'm talking about this fake bloody crap that my father did, and you, you had to see the real thing. At times like this, Lou generally would crawl into his own emotional shell, politely lie and say that he wasn't bothered or offended, and then awkwardly continue his day. He didn't intend to break away from his routine this time, but it still happened. Maybe it was the open and honest vibes radiating from Vivian that brought on his new response. But once it was out, Lou didn't know how to feel. 
I thought it was fake blood when I first saw it on my parents' wall. I have no idea how my mind was going to logic it being there, you know, but that was what I thought for at least a second or two. But you don't have to explain anything to me. He cut her off. My brother Jeff, um, Jeff the Killer, as everyone calls him now, he just snapped one night, I guess. If you knew who I was, then you're familiar with the case, the flare gun, the damage to his face, my mother's concern that he was going to embarrass the family or something. Yeah, I listened to Monica Davenport's Jeff tapes. I guess when you just see it on television and never have to meet the people it happened to, you could just observe it as a spectator. It's wrong that people have to use this for publicity, though. No, it's not. It's a story. They're reporters. Did you know that I tried to tell my parents that night before I went to bed? Vivian shook her head slowly. Jeff was acting weird and... Suddenly a familiar voice laced with sarcastic sarcasm and ill intent broke into their conversation. Fucking Lou! Who's this? Mortician that buried your mom? Trace Duncan asked. He had three other kids with him. Two boys and a girl. She was a cheerleader that often hung around the likes of Trace. Come on. Vivian whispered, giving Lou's arm a slight tug. However, he stood his ground. The sensation was upon him again. The very same feeling that he'd felt when opening up to Viv. It was something that he liked. A sense of situational understanding. He didn't feel flustered or confused, as he almost always did in these types of situations. Logan, the mortician that buried my mom, was a 60-year-old man with a crooked nose and glass eye. Vivian here is anything but that, wouldn't you say? So, you're in the freaks now, Lou! He fired back, causing the cheerleader to giggle her approval. No, just being real with you. Vivian is beautiful. If she were my mortician, I'd probably track down my fucking brother and ask him to finish off what he started. That's sick, dude. The cheerleader scoffed as though all of her friend Logan's comments about Lou's past were just fine, perfectly appropriate, but let the actual survivor say something and suddenly he should be ashamed. A lot of that shit back in Mandeville was sick. Um, Jackie, is it? Jackie, the cheerleader, nodded. Logan, to my knowledge, Jeff never fucked the corpse of my mother, or father for that matter, but then again, it was dark when he came into my room and said that weird goodbye, so if he had a chub, I wouldn't have been able to tell. Logan appeared to consider his options. Lou decided to assist. Logan, you can go ahead and make the joke that's on the tip of your tongue right now. Call me gay for my brother or something. I mean, after all, I just referenced him coming into my dark room with a possible heart on. Or maybe you'd like to know what it was like living there, dealing with assholes like Randy Hayden. Did you know that he and his parents had to go into hiding? I mean, Jeff the Killer took out his two best friends. It seemed logical he was next. What was it like? Yeah, back before Jeff went, you know, asked one of Logan's friends. Crazy as a shithouse rat is the phrase I think you're looking for, Lou corrected. And this time, all those present, Trace Duncan included, responded with laughter that was not at all mean-spirited. Don't we have class? Duncan asked. Logan, I know you aren't worried about getting back to class. Do you guys really want to hear some Jeff stories or not? Let's go. I know a place is some shade out behind the gym. Lead the way, Logan, Lou replied. As he and Vivian followed behind, she leaned close to him and whispered, You don't have to do this, you know. If you don't want to tell these creeps about your past, you certainly shouldn't. Lou turned a smile to Viv, a smile that felt real and happy. A smile, a feeling that he'd been lacking in his life for a very long time. Vivian, I do want to tell them. They're interested. And this shit isn't doing anything but turning into a slow tumor if I keep it bottled up. Come on. They won't be looking for us anytime soon. I'm supposed to be giving you a tour after all. An hour later, Lou finished his story to a crowd of at least a dozen students. Others had seen Logan and his pals circled around the two new kids, and likely assumed that some gawk the action was about to take place. In many ways, they were correct. So, so this fucking asshole Randy, he just 
got away? Logan asked. His tone and demeanor was so different now that it was almost as if he was a different person. Yep. His dad saw the writing on the wall, you know? Jeff was hunting down people, one by one, and Randy most certainly was the next target. Oh, that sucks. That douche sounds like he's he should have been first. Lou, did you ever have, you know, like the same impulses? Like, you know, for revenge? Asked Jackie, the cheerleader. Do you me? Christ, no. I mean, can you imagine what the paper would have called me? My brother already has the least frightening serial killer title in history. I'll get Jack the Ripper. That just sounds cool as shit, but Jeff the Killer? God, I guess whoever was on writing duty that day, he was just going on for the minimalist style, right? If I'd lost my mind too, I'd probably get some Lou the Stabber, homicidal Lou. Vivian whispered as she tugged on his shirt sleeve. What's up? I think we've missed at least two classes by now. I mean, this is fun, and I love listening to your story, obviously, but this is my first day. I don't know if... This is how I wanted to start out here. Logan looked up, a smile on his face. Hey, Lou, your girlfriend need to get to class? Lou felt the defensive wall shift inside him for a moment. Then he looked at the earnest and friendly grin on Logan's face and realized that his question had not been laced with any hint of sarcasm. He honestly just assumed they were together. I think she does, uh, but we're not dating. She just got here today. Oh, well, you guys make a cute couple. You should consider it. Jackie chimed in, and a few other girls nodded in agreement. Okay, then. Later, people. He and Vivian walked away. As they entered the school, their steps making loud echoes in the empty hall, Viv had a life-changing suggestion. Lou, I know it's your story and you're a pain to deal with, but... When you were out there telling your story, I don't know, I saw a real joy in you. I'm not sure if it was just because the usual pricks were sitting and listening instead of hurling insults, but you were enjoying yourself, weren't you? I was. I really was. I never knew what to do with it, you know? The weight of being Lou Woods. Today, though, it just felt right. If you wrote a book, I bet a lot of people would buy it. I don't know. People already know the story. It's all over the internet. Jeff the Killer is possibly the most popular horror story online right now. Probably second most, Vivian responded. Either way, though, Vivian, there isn't much else to tell. The web's pretty much saturated to the, with the plight of Jeff, and I'm not much of a writer. I'm not suggesting you just write about the facts of the case. What I'm saying is that you should write your version, you know? Tell the story your way. Dig into it. Tell them about Lou Woods, not just Jeff Woods. I mean, 2015 is over, right? It was a bad year for you, a bad year for the community of, of Mandeville. If you could give the people something fresh, something new, sure. You have to stick to the original events. But you can add to it, expand it. I bet people would love it. i give that about a 50-50 chance right there, Viv. You at least think about it? Of course. I mean, will you help me if I do? You're the artsy one, after all. Of course. From that day forward, the harassment came to an almost complete halt. It had a taper a bit here and there, but with Logan no longer leading the charge, and the word spreading that Lou was willing to give full details of growing up with one of the most sensationalized murderers in the country, public interest had shifted from ridiculing to listening. Lou and Vivian remained close friends, and she often asked if he'd started writing yet. He always told her that he wasn't quite there yet. In truth, he tried a few times but found himself just staring at his computer monitor. In his head, he could easily string his feelings together. But when it came to translating them into type, he found that even the title was beyond him. Lou, do you want the good news or the bad news? Dealer's choice? Fine. Make me do all the work. I found out today that my parents and I are moving. And guess where? 
Wait, is this is that the good news or the bad news? Who cares, Lou? Guess. Hmm. Um, did your dad finally get that downtown loft he's been interested in? No. I guess I'll just tell you. It's gonna be kind of sad though because it's not Austin, or even in Texas. So you're really moving, like new life moving. Yeah. I'm sorry, Lou. It sucks for me, too. I mean, I was just starting to get to that point where I could walk down the halls without at least one person asking if I worship the devil or if my dad's name was Gomez. It's weird that kids in 2016 would use the Adams family to insult you. It's kind of cool, though. I mean, we're moving to New Orleans. You could totally come visit. <laughs> Show me around. Why are you moving? Tell you what, Lou. Come over, have dinner with me and my family tonight, and I'll tell you all about it. Have dinner with Viviana. Okay. It's on my today list. You wrote down what you're going to do in less than two hours? It was more to validate the statement. That night, Lou dined with Viv and her parents. He'd met them a time or two during his friendship with their daughter, and while they were a bit strange, they were also kind and supportive towards her interests. Her father, a huge man named Casper, explained that his latest art exhibit, simulated murder scene on the streets of downtown Austin, had gone quite poorly. The property management firm who held Casper's lease had received massive public pressure to evict the man, and finally, the powers that he paid rent to caved in. They'd agreed to refund Viv's dad the entirety of what he'd already paid them in rent for the year, plus throw in a sizable check to cover relocation, if Casper would sign a contract agreement not to contest the eviction. Casper felt that he could likely do far more than that, he could probably sue them for breaching their end of the deal, considering that he'd done nothing that violated his rental contract. Casper, however, was not the sue-happy type. He accepted their deal. He and his family decided they'd try New Orleans next. What in particular made you pick New Orleans? Lou asked. Well, for starters, it's close, and it has a great art scene. But I'm sure you know that already, and from what I've read and the contacts that I've spoken to down there, the local crowd might be a bit more accepting to our, um, uniqueness. Vivian smiled and added, he means our weirdness. Renee Alexander, uh, Viv's mom, asked Lou, so what part of town should we move to? So far, we've researched homes in the French Quarter, the Bywater, New Orleans East. I mean, I know crime can be bad there. So what's a middle ground? Well, you'll spend a fortune on a tiny apartment in the French Quarter. Uh, plus, parking's a nightmare down there, and the crowds go all night sometimes. So if you do any art, you know, from home, and you like to have peace of quiet, I'd avoid that. Bywater has sort of become a, a hipster attraction, so it, it, it might fit for your work. Um, New Orleans East, though, that's where Jeff and I grew up. I, I miss it. After dinner concluded that night... Lou and Viviana took a walk down her street together. I wish you guys could just stay in Austin. Thanks to you, I've made some friends here, but you're my closest, he said to her. I know. I want to be excited about the move. I've always wanted to go to New Orleans, but every time I try to get really happy about it, I think about leaving you behind. Lou, I honestly didn't know if I'd make a single friend this year, and on that first day when we met... Well, I really thought I'd ruin any chance of us being friends when I, when I brought up your past so quickly. Viv, you were the first person that wasn't a therapist, journalist, or adult relative that recognized me and treated me like someone they actually wanted to get to know. Remember how Logan was at first? I've been dealing with that all year. If you hadn't got me to talk about it, I still want you to write that book. Please, Lou. I even thought of a title you might like. Jeffrey Woods, Brother, Friend, Killer. I hope that killer part doesn't sound too harsh. You, know, you, you can name it whatever you want, of course, but I wanted to give you a real contribution while we still had time. 
So that's going to be the title then. No questions about it. Love it. And Lou? You can still email, talk on the phone, and, and Facebook. I want regular updates in the book too. Don't go getting famous and forgetting little Viv here. I could never forget you. Of course, I'll bug the hell out of you on the internet. <laughs> Viviana laughed. And they stopped at the corner. They'd walked a bit, and Lou knew that if they didn't turn around now, they might walk all the way to New Orleans, chatting the whole time. Viviana, I... I know we're close friends, and... Lou stopped mid-sentence. He wanted to express to her that he'd grown a bit closer to her than just good friends, but... He was also worried that he could ruin what was the first real friend that he'd made since Jeff vanished. Lou? She replied, her voice dropping to a soft tone. You survived Mandeville. You walked out of your house alive. You're Lou Woods, future best-selling author and all-around amazing person. If you want to kiss me, do it. I like you too. I have for some time. If if I'd known that we were going to move so quickly, I would have told you much earlier. That night, Lou Woods received his first real kiss. He and Viv embraced for several moments before she pulled back and began to giggle. Am I that bad of a kisser? He asked her. No. I just realized that someone is over there watching us. That guy must have come out to check his mail or something. See? Lou looked down the street in the direction of Viv's pointed finger and saw that about a block away was a figure standing on the sidewalk. Due to the distance, he couldn't make out any features. Couldn't even tell if it was a man or a woman. He's still staring at us, Lou said in a flat voice. More to himself than to Viv. Lou focused harder and thought that he could make out something on the person's face. As he stared, Viviana tapped his shoulder. Lou, look past the guy to his left, where the road ends and those bushes are. Does that look like another guy dressed the same? I... I think I see him, yeah. Shit, you're right. They're identical. Lou, look over there behind that red car on the left side of the street. He trained his eyes on the area she pointed and saw a third individual, also playing the statue game. Then he spotted a fourth, another clone stepping out of the darkened bushes. Viv grabbed Lou's arm and whispered in his ear in a harsh voice, I see two more, they're standing in that yard, with a chain-link fence over there. To Lou, this entire scene reminded him of home, when he and Jeff were growing up in Walnut Square. There were some older kids that would sometimes beat up the younger children in the neighborhood, and his current situation reminded him of how it would typically go down. Getting jumped, as it was known, would involve the older kids blocking in their victims by some sort of forming of perimeter. No matter where he might try to run, someone much bigger and stronger would be there. He and Jeff could always tell when it was about to happen, just from the way the aggressors would sort of stand back and wait. Finally, whichever one of the assholes had come up with the idea would make a move, and the rest would close in. Lou looked up the street in the direction of Viv's house to see if more were waiting, closing them in. But he saw no one. Okay. Viviana? We start walking. We walk fast, but don't run. If they're after us, we start sprinting, they'll do the same. I don't know how fast you are, but I know I can't run from here to your house without stopping, and maybe, maybe those guys behind us are all fucking track stars, so we power walk, okay? They start following, we just watch how far back they're staying. If they close in, we start running our asses off, and we just hope that, that we get to your place before we completely run out of steam. Lou, I'm wearing freaking moon boots. I don't know if I can run at all in these. Okay. Okay, we power walk then. If they start charging, we start screaming. We can just run up to one of the houses and start banging on the door if we have to. Lou took another quick glance and confirmed that the silent figures had yet to move. He didn't take the time to verify, but from his brief assessment, 
he estimated there were at least eight of them, all dressed in identical clothing. They were wearing black hooded sweatshirts and black pants. All had their hoods pulled up, turning their faces into mysteries in the darkness. Lou still believed he saw something, though, but, but the poor lighting was difficult to say exactly what. It looked like something was painted on its face, though. Let's move, Lou stated with an authority, and took Vivian by the hand. No sooner did they move than the group of shadowy figures began to move as well. They walked slowly, almost matching Lou's pace. He began to walk faster, and when he'd cast his head back in their direction, he noticed they too picked up their speed. Fuck it, Lou. I'll run in the boots, Viviana declared, and they both began to run, Lou maintaining his grip on her hand. She was indeed slowing them down quite badly, but he wasn't going to leave her. Just as he began to debate the merits of possibly attempting to run while carrying Vivian, two more hooded people moved quickly from behind a parked car and into the street to block them. As Lou turned to consider charging up to a porch, the remainder of the group arrived. He and Viv were now surrounded. Now that the entire freak show was up close, he could see what was on their faces. They were all wearing solid white masks. Two eye holes appeared perfectly round. A single rectangular slit served as the mouth. He saw that a red substance, what, what he thought looked like blood, was smeared across each mask. What do you want? Lou demanded. Hello, it replied. He was a man which was obvious by the voice. Let us go or I'll scream, Viviana stated. The masked speaker pointed towards the first of the four homes that surrounded them. For sale. On vacation. An elderly woman with a hearing aid. He completed pointing to each location and giving them its occupancy status, then turned his attention back to his victims. Lou once again asked, this time in a voice slightly less confident, what it was that they wanted. Did you like seeing their dead bodies? The man asked. Did you see them laying there? Covered in blood. Did it make you happy? Lou was thunderstruck. Do these people know who he was? Were they after him for what Jeff did? Look, I didn't... I didn't have anything to do with it. I just... I, I tried to warn them, Lou stammered. They wouldn't listen. Do they even have names? Can you show the dead at least the respect of calling them by their names? He screamed. Yes! Mom, Dad, Donald, Williamson, Troy, Keith, and the reporter, uh, uh, Rosenberg. Two of the masked figures looked at each other and tilted their heads a bit. Naming them changes nothing. We will not have you here. We shall not allow such evil to enter our community. The man drew a knife, and as if on cue, the rest did as well. Lou tried to position himself in front of Viv, but they were surrounded. He raised his hands, but against such odds, could not muster the will to try to fight. Please. Please don't hurt her. Don't hurt either of us. I, I can't help what Jeff did. I tried to help him. I tried to help them all. Too late. You must pay. It's time. Go to another city. Finally, the entire street was lit up with blinding lights of a motorist's high beams and the deafening sound of a horn. The speaker of the group turned, dropped his knife, and began to try to rally his group into the intersection. The car drove around them and quickly came to a halt, blocking much of the street. Mom! Dad! Vivian exclaimed with joy. Casper threw open the driver's door and reached for the first retreating body that his strong hands could grasp. He was able to catch one of them. There was no struggle as the huge artist slammed his prey onto the side of his car. The rest were fleeing. Lou reached over and picked up the knife that had been dropped. It was rubber. Fake. Just a prop you'd find at a Halloween store. Lou looked back up and saw that Casper had removed the mask. The attacker was a young man, probably only a few years older than Lou and Viv. Perhaps... Perhaps it was the very youthful appearance of the now-detained man that calmed Casper down enough to prevent him from smashing his head into the side of his car. What the 
fuck are you doing to my daughter? Casper demanded. It, it wasn't my idea, sir. I, I was just part of the, the pastor's group. He said that we were just going to scare your daughter so that you... Uh, so that, that so that you 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 wouldn't open up your gallery in Austin again. I'm I'm so sorry. Please, no one was gonna get hurt. Any not anyone. I swear. As Lou heard this, the whole story came together. These men weren't after him. They were after Viviana. All the talk about dead bodies and blood had been in reference to Casper's exhibit. He felt relief running through his body, but he also felt something else. Exposed. Over the past several months since he'd started telling his story, he began each day to feel a little more whole. He'd allowed himself to believe on some level that this was enough. However, after his breakdown in the street, all those emotions were not just brought back, but were also altered in some terrible way. All this time, he'd allowed himself to believe that he and Jeff were both victims in some way. Victims of neglect, victims of bullying, and just plain old victims of circumstance in general. Now, though, now he felt different. He could have done more. On the night that his family returned home from the hospital with Jeff, he'd immediately noticed his brother's mental state. The disfigured boy, admiring his face in the mirror, barely felt like the same person he'd grown up with his entire life. He knew that something was terribly wrong. He felt it strongly enough that he risked knocking on his parents' closed door. Cardinal Sin in the woods home for sure. When his parents told him to leave, he'd given up. He could have continued to knock. He could have demanded to at least speak with his father. After their chat at the hospital, Lou had felt that a renewed bond with his dad had been formed. He could have done something more than simply returning to his bedroom and eventually falling asleep. The sound of approaching police sirens broke Lou's dreadful reflection. The police arrived and the familiar song and dance took place. Lou and Viviana gave their accounts of what happened. Castor explained to the officers that he'd become worried that his Viv and Lou were gone so long on what was supposed to be a short walk up the block. The final statements came from the former masked boogeyman that was now just a sniveling and terrified boy, really. His name was Joshua Paris. He was 18. By the time the smoke settled and Casper finally returned from the police precinct, the whole story was out, and it was something that Viviana's father had apparently been dealing with for some time. It turned out to be the work of the East Austin Holy Book, a non-denominational church of Christ that was known for its outspoken politics and frequent boycotts and protests. Casper had been keeping this information from his wife and daughter so as to not worry them. He explained they'd started to harass him several weeks ago due to the nature of his art. They demanded that he close his gallery, or else. Casper had called their bluff, and when they continued to send in church members posing as customers, members would browse until there was a good number of clients in the gallery, and then begin ranting and raving like a Puritan minister. Casper even admitted to Rene, which earned him a dirty look and a slap on the back of his head, that he'd intentionally increased the gore factor of his latest exhibit just to piss this church off. That had cost him, though, as his over-the-top display of death and gore gave the community enough concern to join in with the Holy Book Church in pressuring the property owner to remove Casper from the building. The little stunt tonight was meant to scare Casper away from Austin, more than likely. So that kid I roughed up tonight, Joshua. The detectives already told me that he was making a deal with the district attorney. The kid's young, and according to his parents, who thankfully were not members of this church as well, told me that he'd already been awarded a full-ride scholarship to Texas Tech. The detectives didn't even have to lean on him very hard. He was ready to make any deal so long as he stayed out of jail and still got to attend college. From what I've been told, this pastor, uh, uh, Buddy Carter... He's been known for doing this kind of shit in the past. This time, though, they have a solid couple of witnesses and, of course, Mr. Texas Tech Joshua's testimony. I don't know. They think they can get him for real. For a moment, Lou felt a rise in joy. If they, if they had to go through a trial, then perhaps they'd stay in Austin. Mr. Casper, does this mean that you're not going to move? Lou asked. 
His momentary euphoria shattered upon hearing Casper's response. No, Lou, I'm, I'm really sorry, but it actually is quite the opposite. We're going to pull Viv from school tomorrow. While I was waiting down at the precinct, I went ahead and closed a quick rental deal with some apartments in New Orleans East, so let's... Um, it looks like you have the best suggestions. Casper's attempt at putting a positive note on the situation was appreciated, but Lou was too disappointed to benefit from it all. So when are you leaving? Renee answered as she'd been working the logistics while Casper was downtown. Tomorrow evening. Viv's face showed a shock and made Lou's melancholy accelerate. Mom, how can we even do that? We have nothing packed. I'm not enrolled in school down there. I mean, come on, I have a, a biology paper due in two days and... She looks briefly at Lou. And I, I have other important matters here. I mean... Please, Mom, can't we just wait? Casper answered for his wife. Sweetheart, listen. We can't stay here with this batshit church running around there. Even if they arrest the pastor, that doesn't mean other people might not come after us. I can't bear the thought of you being attacked like that again, and if they threaten two kids with bloody masks and fake knives because of an art exhibit, I don't want to think what they might do in retaliation for having their leader arrested. But Dad! Casper's voice raised a notch an action he so rarely took against his daughter that she jumped a bit at first. Viviana! This is the part where you have to just listen. You know your mother and I respect you as an equal in most things, but this is a time where you have to be the child and we have to be the parents. We're pulling you from school tomorrow. You may have to miss a couple weeks while we get you set up in New Orleans, but that's okay. We won't make you go to summer school or anything like that unless, unless you want to. We're going to Lake Charles tomorrow. It's three hours away from New Orleans. We have friends of mine there from the art scene. He has an extra studio. It's currently vacant. He's going to let us store all of our things in there, and we can live in a loft above it until we have things all ready to roll in New Orleans, and I'll have to sell up a lot of our personal collection to raise the money to get the gallery running in New Orleans, and I doubt that I'll get nearly as good a deal as if I would have if we waited, but I cannot... And I will not put my family in danger. Lou. Can Lou spend the night? She asked. Not directing the question to any parent in particular. I don't think that's really appropriate, Viv. Renee answered. Lou could tell by the sound of her voice that it was likely a rare moment in Alexander's home when there were at odds with their daughter. He can sleep on the couch. I mean, we're not going to do anything, I promise, but... Viviana broke down in tears and collapsed into a sitting position on the floor. Lou hated to see her like this, but he didn't know what to say to make it any better. As he pondered any useful words, Casper tapped his shoulder and asked him to talk privately in the kitchen. Lou nodded. Tonight, Lou. Tonight you attempted to stand between men with knives and my daughter. I never... I never imagined anyone willing to do something like that besides Renee or myself. You are a remarkable kid, and... Well, I, I started thinking out... Uh, out there that you and Viviana... You seem to have a very solid friendship, and I'd be willing to bet that friendship's not where it's, um, not where it's going to end. This comment caused Lou to blush. Well, sir, I mean, I, I like your daughter, you know, like a great friend, but also, I mean, I, I mean, she... Casper held up a hand and gestured for Lou to pause. Lou, you and Viviana like each other. It's okay. As I said before, you've shown more courage and valor as a teenager than a lot of adults I know would ever demonstrate. And believe me, Viviana talks about you all the time here. We knew that she saw you as more than just a friend when she couldn't help but smile each and every time her phone rang and your name was on the screen. So, here is what I'm proposing. Come back with us. Uh, back to New Orleans. 
Obviously, we'd have to run it through the proper channels. Your legal guardians would have to approve, as as would the courts, and they'd have to pull you from school. I, I mean, it's a lot. But look, I heard the way your voice became so down when you were telling us about your old neighborhood. After all, after all you've been through, I'm, I know you must be homesick as well. That place you told me about, Walnut Square, the apartment I got us is a couple blocks away. Hasn't even been two years since you moved from there, right? Bet most of your old friends are still there. I mean, and I mean, that would be good for Viviana. I think it would be good for you. I guess, I guess what I'm saying, son, is you... You looking out for Viv tonight isn't the only reason I'm inviting you. I can't imagine what it was like to live through what you did. You deserve a fresh start. A, a real fresh start. Not out here in Austin with distant relatives. Back at home. I don't know if you and Viviana are destined for uh, for a romance or not. But even if you two decide to just stay friends, you're still welcome to be a part of our family. If you two do end up dating uh, uh, at least I know my daughter has a boyfriend that I don't have to polish my gun in front of just to make sure that he treats her right. So. I know you need some time to think on it. What are your thoughts on the offer? Lou gave a brief smile and nodded with conviction. That could be good, I, I guess, he said, with no faith that his forced response carried any credibility as truth. Casper clearly picked up on it. When he spoke again, he did not attempt to sell the idea any further. Instead, he handed Lou one of his business cards and told him that if he was interested in taking them up on the offer, to have his aunt and uncle call him up, then they could begin the process of working it out. They shook hands. Lou hadn't planned to leave so soon when he and Casper walked into the kitchen, nor had Casper intended to ask him to go home. He'd actually considered Viv's request and thought that perhaps the couch was a safe enough place. He trusted his daughter, and and after tonight, he trusted Lou. However, something hung in the air now, and both knew exactly what it was. Lou clearly was not going to take his offer to come along with his family to New Orleans. Lou himself had no intention to even ask his aunt and uncle about the proposal. He had his reasons, and as much as he desired to spend more time with Viviana, he knew this was not the time to return home. Hey, Casper began. I won't mention the move idea to Viv unless you decide that you want to go for it, you know. Um, I don't want to get her hopes up. Thank you, Lou replied softly. He was trying not to cry in front of the man. Lou and Renee shared a hug. She told him that he was an honorary Alexander for the rest of his life. Viviana and Lou went out to the porch of their home to wait for his uncle to come and pick them up. For almost ten minutes, they did not speak. Viv's crying had stopped, leaving only random bursts of sobs, and then that stopped as well with only sniffles and red eyes to remind her that the breakdown was ever there. Lou finally strung together a thought and the words to carry it to his friend. I'm sorry for freaking out tonight when the guys were throwing out all those questions. I thought it was, I thought it was something to do with my brother. Oh, no problem. Honestly, I did too. I didn't know Dad was getting heat from the church all the time. Fuck them. I hope they bust that pastor really soon. Lou, are you really okay? With all the stuff we've been talking about? He sighed. Uh -huh. I wanted to talk to her about this, but with the emotions being so new, he wasn't quite sure how to say what he wanted to. 
I'm always okay when you're around. And that even if we're surrounded by idiots with plastic knives. Really, I thought that I was getting over it. Telling the other kids at school did help a lot, and I'll always owe you for that. Don't forget the book title, too, she amended, finally with a tone of voice that, while not happy at least, wasn't completely miserable. Of course, yeah. But to be truthful, I never considered that I could have done so much more than I did. A minute longer of banging on the door, and my parents might still be alive. Jeff could have gotten help. A minute more of knocking at the door, Viv, and who knows? Maybe six people wouldn't have died. I don't know, Lou. Sometimes I write these wild little formulas, maybe. Just dumb pseudo-goth crap, like, like everyone would expect from me. One night I was thinking about the time I got... Oh, promise not to laugh, Lou. Promise? One morning I got hit with a garbage can. The next few seconds were some of the most mentally grueling of Lou's life, as he fought not to fall from the chair in a fit of laughter. He fought hard, though, and after a few seconds that felt like hours went by, his urge to laugh passed. How, exactly? It was a Saturday morning a few years ago. There was this stupid bagel shop about a mile from our house. They opened at 4 a.m. and usually had a line at the door well before. And see, they, they sold something called a knucklehead. It was some sort of bear claw looking pastry, and people raved about them. They only made a few dozen every morning, though. And once they ran out, that was it. And so one night, I decided to set my alarm for 3 a.m. and just pedal down there and wait. I wanted a damn knucklehead, Lou, and... And I was sick of all these early bird donut lovers snatching them all up. So, my alarm goes off at 3, and I hit snooze. It goes off five minutes later, and I get up, and I get dressed, and I start riding my bike to the bakery. And as I'm biking, a garbage truck is up ahead, doing the typical routine. I get on the sidewalk in order to be a safe distance. Just as I pass the rear of the truck, the trash collector must have just... Must have just... Dumped the can. So... You know how they do, they dump the can, they throw the can, and drive to the next house. Well, they changed it up for me. They, It was dump the can, throw the can into Viviana, and then Viviana goes to the hospital. I got two cracked ribs and it dislocated my shoulder. Damn. Rough morning. But, but what does that have to do with your little formula or whatever? Well, I started thinking, like, what if I hadn't hit snooze? But what if I hit snooze a second time? Every impulse in my body was telling me to do it. I'll tell you, the the garbage truck would have been somewhere else when I got to that part of the sidewalk. The trash can that ensured I'd never throw the discus in the Olympics would have still been full of trash had I skipped the snooze. Or it would have already been empty if I hit it again. But then I started realizing that I could trace it back even further. When my alarm went off the first time, I almost just turned it off. I mean... It's Saturday morning. Is some pastry really worth torturing myself into clothes? Had I not gone out that morning at all, I too could be in a totally different place right now. Or my bike. I had to pump up the tires on it the night before. Something I would have done sooner, but my dad broke out our air pump. It just happened that someone threw one away a couple of days before in the dumpster behind my dad's gallery. He noticed it there, and when he saw it, it still functioned. So he brought it home. My dad only went out to the dumpster to run to the trash because his clerk called in sick that day. So had my dad not brought the pump home, I wouldn't have been able to fill my tires, and that also would have changed everything. And anyway, I I just kept going with it, diving back deeper and deeper, and finally I googled the history of the little bagel shop. Turns out that the two original owners met because one of them bent down to pick up a nickel from the sidewalk, but before doing, asked someone to please hold his briefcase. A helpful guy that happened to be an investor looking for ideas happened to be there and offered to hold the case. They got to talking after that, and eventually they founded the bagel place. So, it was this. 
Imagine if whoever dropped that nickel back in 1945 or something had noticed it and picked it up. Or what if the other bagel guy hadn't had time to hold the briefcase? Or what if the first guy just didn't notice the nickel? No matter what, it likely would have meant no bagel shop, and thus no place for me to wake up at 3 a.m. for. Think about it, Lou. I had to wrap my ribs like a mummy and never pick up anything heavy and miss a ton of school, all because back in 1945, some guy dropped a nickel on the ground. Wow. That's deep, Viv. I can't tell if you're being sarcastic or not, but Lou, what I'm saying is that some things that we think just happened because of whatever may already be set in motion anyway. If you'd managed to get your parents to come to the door, maybe they would have gone to check on Lou. Maybe they would have sent him back to the hospital, or maybe he would have just refused to tell them anything and they would have gone right back to their room thinking he was fine. That's how blame works, Lou. You go back to one point in time when you had some kind of control and you put yourself into this position of godhood. But all this stuff happens because of things that had already happened. If Randy's dad had locked up the flare gun, none of this would have happened. If Randy's mom had been on birth control, none of this would have happened. If your dad hadn't been offered the promotion and a job in Mandeville, maybe, maybe, maybe. I mean, you can trace it back to Randy's great-great-grandparents meeting for the first time if you want. The present adds up no matter what, Lou. And it always will. Lou stared at the young woman still sitting next to him. In that moment, he decided that he loved her. You're the best person I've ever known, he told her. Tears danced in his eyes. She leaned into him and the two embraced in a slow and gentle kiss that lasted until the sound of an approaching vehicle, Lou's ride, interrupted their shared affection. Come see me tomorrow. Come see me before I leave tomorrow. Okay, Lou? I'll be here. Good night, Viv. Right? He almost said that he loved her. However, to express such a profound truth and then immediately drive off seemed as though it would cheapen the deal. This wasn't some corny romantic comedy where such absurd actions were considered cute and were accompanied by a lighthearted soundtrack. Lou rode home without speaking very much. His aunt and uncle had about a million questions concerning the attack from the church members. Lou played it down as a scare tactic based on them being offended by an art exhibit. Still, he told the same story and answered the same questions over and over again until their guardians gave in to their age and the lateness of the hour. They retired to bed and Lou... Lou began to write his book. Once he began to allow the words to flow, the story being told line by line, truth by truth, and pain by pain, he found that he didn't want to stop. It wouldn't be until the sun itself began to lighten the sky that he realized he'd been up all night. He was tired, but felt a pang of regret the moment that he saved and closed the file. As soon as it was gone from his screen... He wanted it back. There was still so much to tell. He climbed into his bed and closed his eyes, feeling almost certain that he wouldn't be able to sleep. As he lay still, allowing his mind to wander and ponder, his mind went to Viviana. He loved her. He knew that to be a truth and not a product of a youthful optimism. He wanted to be with her no matter what, no matter where. He felt a touch of guilt at turning down Casper's offer as he did. Viv's dad had most likely expected Lou to be thrilled at the chance to move back home. Lou loved his aunt and uncle and was appreciative that they took him in. But he also felt like a constant guest in their house. A welcome guest, sure, but a guest is a guest. He understood that he would essentially still be a guest in the Alexander home. 
but with their acceptance of the growing relationship with their daughter, perhaps it would be more like family. He could show Viv around his old neighborhood, introduce her to his old friends, and eventually take her out to Mandeville and show her where the infamous crimes occurred, the ones that shattered his life. He might even say something sweet to her, tell her how he was indeed shattered until he found her and she put him back together. He smiled at that, and decided at that moment that he would apologize to Casper and accept the offer. If he were lucky, maybe they'd keep Viviana in Austin for another couple of days, as Casper and Renee would have to hammer out a lot of details with Lou's guardians. He also decided that he would tell Viv as soon as he saw her that he loved her. No waiting. He was Lou Woods, a survivor, as Viv herself assured him. He was not weak. He should not be afraid of life. Sleep finally took Lou as he was imagining his life to be with Viv and her parents in New Orleans East. He drifted off knowing that his old life, home, and peace of mind would soon return. When he awoke sometime later, he had an immediate feeling that something was wrong. The sunlight that illuminated his room was too bright, he sat up and struggled to focus his newly awakened eyes on the digital clock on his desk. When he finally was able to see the time, an immediate cocktail of regret and panic rose in him. It was after 3 p.m., late into the afternoon. Lou fumbled about his nightstand until he found his cell phone, and he was further horrified to see that he'd failed to charge it the night before. It was dead. He rolled out of bed quickly, placed the phone on his charger. It would still be a few minutes, though, before it had enough juice to come on and stay on. He sat down on his computer desk and opened his email. What he feared was waiting. Email from Viviana Alexander to Lou Woods. Dear Lou, I tried to get my parents to wait longer, but eventually they said that we had to get on the road. I'm not angry, so no worries. I guess something came up. We were attacked last night by crazy people after all, lol. And don't feel guilty. We'll talk on the phone and stuff real soon, and if you feel guilty about not getting to say goodbye in person, don't, okay? We had a beautiful goodbye on my porch last night. I'm not sure if I could top that anyway. Get your mind out of the gutter, lol. So we can always say that our first goodbye was on a high note. I can't wait for you to come down to New Orleans and visit. Well, I'm gonna go. Call when you can. Viv. The timestamp on the email showed that it was sent two hours ago. Regardless, Lou rushed to throw on clothes and race downstairs. His uncle, a man old enough to be mistaken for a younger grandfather, was sitting at the kitchen table, sort of just staring off. Uncle Mark, can you drive me over to Viviana's house? Uh, where you picked me up last night? Oh, you're waiting to go and say goodbye? Yes, please. I, I think they, they may have left already, but they might still be packing. Can you please take me over there? I wish I could, Lou, but your aunt has the car. Well, she went shopping. Knowing that woman, she won't be home until late. Just take the bus. That house ain't too far away. Lou looked down at his feet and felt the heat of frustration. He had no idea how the bus system in Austin ran. In New Orleans, he could have mapped that city from end to end by the way of the New Orleans Regional Transit Authority. In Austin, though, he'd... He'd be lost by the first intersection. Uncle Mark, I, I don't know the bus route. Lou's uncle frowned in empathy. Do you know the address? I think I can spare a cab fare if you don't tell your aunt that I'm just handing it out her money. Lou realized that he didn't know the address at all. He knew her neighborhood, though, a, a subdivision called Glenshire. All the streets had Renaissance-style names. If he could get there, he's quite certain that he could find her home. <sighs> okay, okay, yeah, that sounds great, Lou stated with enthusiasm that felt very artificial. While his uncle fished out a couple of $20 bills, Lou called the first cab company his phone's Google app produced and got the ball rolling. As he did this, though, trying to feel excited about the prospect of seeing her, his mind was scolding him as though he was the dumbest human being alive. Just call her his mind demanded. If she's still home, you can actually tell her to wait and increase your odds. Plus, it'll save you a cab ride. True logic if there ever was. 
However, Lou needed the slight chance right now. As long as he remained intentionally naive, the hope that she was still home remained real, even if it was highly misguided and unlikely. At the core of it all, if Lou actually believed that she was still there, he'd call her and ask her to wait. Lou and Jeff grew up in an environment of constant disappointment, though, from their parents to themselves. They'd become far too skilled at detecting bad outcomes. He knew she was most likely halfway to the Louisiana state line if Casper drove fast. The truth, though, was ugly and cruel. He gave no shelter, cared not for the feelings of a lovesick teenager. The lie, though. The lie he told himself, well, that... That provided hope. That lie allowed Lou to imagine his cab pulling up as Viviano was perhaps just sitting outside with a box or a bag in her arms, bringing whatever they could to the car while the rest would be packed up later. He imagined that she looked up and see the cab, dismissing it at first, but then quickly snapping back, eyes growing wide, smile growing more radiant as she locked eyes with him. The cab would stop on the curb and she'd already be racing over he shoved the cash in the driver's hand, jumping out without concerning himself with change. They would hug, she would laugh and scold him for oversleeping. He would tell her that he loved her and hoped that, hoped that she maintained her joy. He would tell her about Casper's offer that he wanted to take. She'd be overjoyed and hug him even harder. He and Casper would talk again, this time with Viv in attendance. He wouldn't leave with them today, but... Plans would be set in motion soon enough, and he and Viviana would be walking down Crowder Boulevard in New Orleans East, together, hand in hand. That was the lie that prevented Lou from conducting a simple and surefire method to save him both time and money, because saving the time and money were components of the same cold reality where his parents were dead, and his brother was an insane monster. The lie was where he decided to take shelter until the cold truth would inevitably find him. After what seemed like an eternity, the cab finally pulled up. Lou's uncle made the same joke for the tenth time since the cab was requested. Calm down, Lou. She's still gonna be pretty when you get there. He told Lou that he'd spotted them kissing as they pulled up the night before, but didn't want to embarrass him in front of his aunt. Lou thanked him for his discretion, though he was sure that his aunt saw too, and was met with the same wink and smile that his uncle always employed when discussing the matters of the real world, as he called them. Mark had allowed Lou to drink a beer once, and damn near winked and smiled at every sip. However, he was a kind man who treated his nephew like an adult for the most part, and considering how easily Lou could have ended up as Aunt Marcy's house in Albeda Springs... He counted this as a blessing each and every time. The cab ride was almost as unbearable as the wait to be picked up. The driver seemed to catch every single red light, every yellow light that even the most elderly of drivers would likely pass up. This driver apparently stopped for everything. He seemed to always teeter just under the speed limit and would slow down and wave any car in that was waiting to exit a parking lot. Lou considered that he might just have found the world's only courteous and safe taxi driver. As nice as this rare find might be in a normal situation, he currently found himself practically crawling out of his skin, though. He wanted to scream for the driver to hurry up. Each time the cab took a long and slow halt to meet the commands of a stop sign or reduce speed to a crawl to take a turn, Lou wondered if perhaps he didn't contract some of Jeff's insanity, like an airborne virus. Initially, Lou had told the man to drop him at the gates of Glenshire Housing Subdivision, but upon seeing the place, finally, he felt confident that he could actually guide the driver there. He turned out to be right. The subdivision was smartly developed with easy-to-remember landmarks and a simple grid of streets with no surprises or dead ends. When Lou saw Capulet Street, a fitting name since he was in the pursuit of love, though thankfully not contested like the street's namesake, he asked the driver to let him out here. Viv's house was around the middle, and Lou could walk it in less than two minutes. The truth, though, was that Lou, already knowing he'd be walking up to a vacant house, knew that he'd want some time by himself to digest the sadness that would follow. He most certainly didn't want to break down into tears 
And while he was pretty confident that he wouldn't, he didn't want to risk it in front of a stranger. If Viv wasn't there, he'd just walk for a bit, let his mind work around his folly of oversleeping and missing her call, and he'd just call for another cab and go home. After paying the cabbie, Lou began the brisk walk to Viv's house. He almost wished the walk could be a bit longer. He was safe in his lie still. Once the house was in sight, he immediately felt his hope drop to near extinction. Casper's huge sedan wasn't in the driveway. Already strike one and Lou hadn't even stepped on the porch yet. He saw the porch light wasn't on, although twilight was approaching, and didn't see any lights from the windows. Strike two. Preparing for the final strike, before getting sent back to the dugout, Lou was actually amazed when he saw the front door was not closed. The door was halfway open, which in his experience was the standard sign of people moving out or into a house. Since all their large possessions were still inside, the door wouldn't be open unless they were home. Lou's mind returned, although with caution, to his imagined world that carried him to sleep last night. He'd knock on the door while allowing it to swing open a bit more. He'd probably hear music playing as Viv threw together the last essentials that she'd needed. She'd light up with joy as she realized who was at the door. And maybe Casper had taken the car out to get some provisions for the road. Maybe, maybe he'd gone down to make sure the gas tank was full and the tires were fully inflated. Either way, Lou didn't care. Upon reaching the door, though, Lou began to doubt his second chance. And that cautious optimism that fueled his daydream diminished quickly. Lou knocked, but received no response. Looking through the partially open door showed Lou a dark house. There were no lights on and no sounds of music or television. The place simply screamed empty. So why the open door? Surely they weren't in such a rush to leave town that they left all their possessions unsecured. Lou didn't think a robbery was taking place either. Growing up in New Orleans, he'd seen a few going down from time to time. There was no vehicle to load the stolen goods into. No lookout man to make sure the neighbors weren't getting nosy. And from what he could tell by looking at the door, there's no sign of forced entry. Ignoring his increasing sense that something here was wrong in favor of the still lingering hope that Viviana might be just inside, Lou opened the door completely and knocked loudly on its wooden surface. It's, it's me, Lou! Is anyone home? No response. He peered further inside and could still find no sign of activity. He knocked again, louder than the first time, and once again called out. No response. When his cell phone began to ring loudly from his back pocket, Lou jumped a bit in surprise. The silence had crept up around him so slowly that his ringtone sounded as though speakers amplified it. He looked at the screen and saw that Viv was calling him. His mind took no time to indulge in the fantasy that perhaps she was upstairs or in the backyard. Instead, he just hit the talk button and hoped for a miracle. Viv! Hey, believe it or not, I'm actually at your... Her voice frantic replied. I know, Lou. I started getting these weird videos. Look, you have to get out of there. You're in danger. What, what, what do you mean? About ten minutes ago, my parents and I started receiving these weird... These weird videos. Someone out there, they got our information or something. They sent us a video of them walking around in our house, looking through our things, and then... Then just a minute ago, I received a video from them. Here, I'm sending it, but don't stand there and watch it. Start... Start calling for help or something. Lou was far too enraptured both in her story and in that sense of safety that anyone standing outside on a clean street in a nice neighborhood with adequate sunlight to follow the good advice that Viv was providing. He did back up a few steps from the open door, but the front yard was empty and he was sure he could hear a lawnmower nearby. The environment simply defined safety and Lou's intellectual mind could seemingly not move forward unless it was assisted by real fear. As he waited for the video to start, he asked the most important question he could imagine. Viviana, are you and your parents okay? Her voice was growing more impatient with each response. Yes, Lou, we're almost to the state line. Are you looking for help? Are you knocking on doors? Come on, Lou, the video, they're watching! Lou looked back to his screen and suddenly... The fear came fast and without mercy. The video Viv sent him showed a replay of the last five minutes of his life. The video, which appeared to have been shot from across the street in the cover of bushes, was Lou, 
walking towards Viv's house. He watched himself slowly approach her porch, saw how he'd slowed down in reaction to the open door, then watched as he climbed the steps and eventually began knocking. The video cut off at that point. He raised the phone back to his head, finally intending to turn and run to the next house, following the same game plan that he'd devised the night before to bang on doors and scream. Did you call the police? He asked her. The voice from behind him, almost in his ear. They'll never make it in time. Before Luke could turn, he was struck in the head. He didn't know by what, but he recalled the strange sensation that came with the blow. He realized, in a thought process that felt very slippery and difficult to follow, that he dropped his phone. He watched it drift slowly to the ground. He felt his knees buckle just slightly before blacking out. An unknown amount of time passed before Lou regained consciousness. He came back to reality slowly, taking in what his confused mind and throbbing head would allow. He was in a chair. His attempt to move, though, was stifled by something. His eyes were pulsing in painful rhythm with his rapidly accelerating heartbeat. The room was well lit, a harsh white that could come from no other source than industrial fluorescent tubes. He moved his head left to right, wincing at the stiffness that settled onto his neck. On both sides, he saw rows of white sheets, the sort with the hard plastic base and backrests that could be linked together if desired. The floor was white tile. Looking ahead, he saw a podium with a microphone rising from it. Speakers were set up in the corners, and in the very center was a table covered in white cloth. As Lou continued to gather any information that might explain where he was and how he got here, he suddenly heard footsteps approaching quickly. They were very loud in the large space as they clicked on the hard tiles. Hello? Lou called out. In a blur, a large figure walked past him. A man. He wore a black shirt tucked into olive drab cargo pants. Hello, where... where am I? Lou asked again, feeling some degree of control returning to his voice and mind as the fog of his time unconscious continued to clear. The man ignored him and instead briskly walked over to a wooden door. From the looks of the room, this door did not lead to the outside world, but rather to an office or storage room. The man knocked on the door in three rapid strikes that appeared almost rehearsed. Each strike was uniform to the one before it. Someone gave a verbal reply to the knock. He's awake, sir. The man spoke in a manner that sounded like the stereotypical way that people in the military are portrayed, very robotic and loud, like anger that had been tempered by discipline but never fully removed. Hey, hey, can you please tell me what happened? Lou attempted to stand, momentarily forgetting about the prior sensation of being restrained, and found that his hands were tied at his sides. He looked down frantically and saw that his feet were also strapped to the base of the chair. Why, why am I tied up? What is this? The man in cargo pants continued to ignore Lou. Instead of replying, he simply walked up to the left side of the cloth-covered table and took a standing position there. His posture appeared, like his voice, to be an imitation of the military. The wooden door opened. Lou observed a man of perhaps maybe his late fifties or early sixties enter. He was very thin, with blonde hair that was unquestionably achieved through hair dye. He wore a suit that would be an eyesore in any gathering. It was light blue. A similarly colored tie completed the outfit, and on the lapel of his jacket was a golden cross. The man in the blue suit walked in a bizarre style that seemed as though it needed music to function correctly. His wrists swung about. He kicked his heels. As he passed in front of Lou, he flashed a smile that appeared very genuine, but not intended to demonstrate any positive intentions. Lou thought that if someone could look gleefully disgusted, that might be the look to accompany it. Blue Suit continued to shake and shimmy his way over to cargo pants. He walked up close to the large man and gave him two pats on the shoulder. Cargo looked Blue in the eyes and gave him a sharp nod. And finally, Dance walking back to the center of the stage, Blue spoke to Lou. Mr. Woods, Mr. Lou Woods of the Sodom of the South, New Orleans. The man in the suit spoke in a deep southern accent, 
very much in the style of the charismatic, red-faced, and fired-up televangelist that appeared on the cable access channels very late at night. Sir, what? Lou attempted to ask yet again the simple question of where he was and was cut off immediately as Blue Suit continued. Blue directed his attention to cargo pants. Brother Anthony, did you know, did you know that Mr. Woods here is a celebrity? Brother Anthony smiled and focused his gaze as though he was some kid listening to a ghost story. One that he knew the good parts of were almost upon him. Blue continued. Oh yes, Brother Anthony, Mr. Lou Woods here is none other than the brother of that crazy boy down in New Orleans. What went and killed his mama and papa. Can you believe that he washed up from the Sodom of the South to the Gomorrah of the Lone Star State? It's crazy how sin is a magnet. Isn't that what I always say, Brother Anthony? Yes, sir, responded Anthony. His response terrified Lou more than his knocking or walking habits. Lou heard no humanity in the booming affirmation. What he did hear was an eagerness to appease and a clear, blind obedience. Now, Mr. Woods, I am the good Reverend Buddy Sherman Carter. You may call me Reverend Carter. We are in the Lord's house, but it is I who keep these lights burning, so I demand the respect that should accompany my efforts. You are clearly a guest of sorts, I'd say in my house of praise, more commonly known as the East Austin Holy Book. I do hate so much that I must include the forsaken city in the name of my house of God, but it is very important that people know where to come to receive the only real truth that anyone out there, that anyone other than the Lamb of God above, is going to tell them on this sad, sick planet. And that right, Brother Anthony? And I'm the only source besides God himself who's going to tell these poor, lost sinners the truth. Yes, sir. Now, Mr. Woods, since we've been formally introduced, I will ask that you forgive me for dropping the title of Mr. and simply referring to you as Lou. I don't care if you like it. This is my house. The only authority that can override mine here is God above. Lou. Lou, you think God gonna come down and tell me how to untie you from that chair because if he do i promise you son that i will obey his command to the letter if god tells me to turn over the lease to this church to you then i'll do so without question for you for lou i do not question the will of god but you sure do don't you sinner sir i i i no sooner had Lou begun to speak, Brother Anthony was upon him. He gripped Lou's ears and began to twist them. The pain grew until he was terrified that the huge man would simply rip them off his head. Okay now, Brother Anthony, we need not cause more harm than necessary. Lou, I was quite fair and direct with you at the start of our conversation that you were to refer to me as Reverend, am I not? As the goon released pressure on his ears, Lou struggled to find the ability to speak. He didn't want to make this man ask him... Any questions twice? Yes. Yes, Reverend, you, you did. Okay, good. I was just checking because I thought that I might be losing my marbles. So, since you remember your instructions, a simple request, if I do say so, you must have called me Sir in order to get a rise out of me, didn't you? Reverend, no, it was a mis... Oh, so you're saying that I'm lying in the house of God. Yes, indeed. What a world the Lord has given us to suffer upon. Lou, while I am a man of God, I think you need to be well aware that I am also a man of action. And my actions are all taken from the Holy Scripture, so that means my actions are in line with God's will. Brother Anthony, can God lie? No, sir. Of course not. God does not lie. And I'm a reflection of the will, the word and the sword of the Lord. So, if I could not have lied, that means you're still trying to get a rise out of me. Maybe, Lou. Maybe you see an old man such as me, and you think, if you get me worked up enough, I might just fall over and die. The reverend leaned in very close to Lou and uttered a laugh that was rancid 
a mixture of sinister intent and unbridled conviction. In a lower, almost conversation tone, he continued, Lou, now listen, little sinner. Many have tried to bring about my demise. You most clearly ain't the first. You, you for sure ain't the worst. You will not be the last. No way either. See, so long as I'm out there preaching the word, telling these sinners all the things they don't want to hear, telling these sodomites, these whores, these gamblers, fornicators, worshipers of all idols false, people are always going to want to shut me up and turn off the truth. It ain't easy hearing the truth, now is it? Lou, hoping that silence was a safe alternative, found out quickly that there was no safe choice here. Once again, Anthony gripped his ears and resumed the blindingly painful twisting that was his obvious go-to form of corrective action. Answer the Reverend when he speaks to you. Reverend, I'm sorry for whatever I did. I just, just, please don't kill me. Carter nodded, and Lou's ears were released once again. Hear that, Brother Anthony? He's sorry for what he did and has even found the humanity to ask forgiveness. The Lord's means are never wrong, are they? Why, he had to turn Lot's wife into a pillar of salt just to get his message across to her. I wonder until this day, as she took her last breaths, did she finally understand how honest our God is? And that is merciful. That time that he gave a sinner a choice to obey one rule and live. Other times the Lord has had to take greater steps. He flooded the earth out of his love for his people. Luke. Had to get rid of all the trash so that his flock, those that were on the ark, could live in a clean world. So that's how God works, Lou. He might ask you once, might ask you twice. Maybe, maybe just got to Gotta ask you thrice. Please love me. That's all he asks, Lou. When he gets ignored, he goes back to the drawing board, Lou, and that's, that's what creators do. They go back, re-examine the blueprints, try to make a better plan. That's all any of that ever is. Our God don't punish for no reason. But Lou... You've put yourself in line for some judgment, I do believe, and I am the agent of God to carry out his most righteous commands. Reverend, please, can you tell me what I did to you? I don't understand any of this. In response to Lou's question, Carter began to execute some strange side-to-side -side sway. Every complete left to right would be accompanied by a clap of his hands. He wants to know what did he do, Lord? He wants to know how he has sinned. The Bible lays out such simple sets of rules to follow. No surprise in there. Yet every time we get one of these little sinners in this very chair, they can't even figure out when of the ten simple little commandments they broke. I keep praying that one night we're going to get a smart one in here. A quick repent and out the door they go. Brother Anthony, I am starting to believe that the all heavenly father gets a kick out of testing this old man. That's fine, Lord. For I am your most humble servant and obedient child, and I cannot fail you, Lord, because everything I do, I do for you. Lou felt tears begin to roll down his cheeks. He had no idea what to do or say that wouldn't result in pain or, or worse. The reverend continued. Now, Lou. Every time I ask you a question, you go all flip in the mouth, trying to kill me from the shock that a young little sinner is so far gone that even in God's house, he cannot control his forked tongue. So to demonstrate mercy, I'll ask that you simply listen. That perhaps if you still yourself, Brother Anthony will not keep finding needs to correct you. You're here because last night you and that little whore caused quite the problem for my flock. Because of you, one of my sheep was n not only captured by the corrupt and ever so sinful Austin police, but my sources, which are 
multiple and far reaching tell me that my lost sheep began to spread awful lies about what it is that I do and why I had my flock doing the will of God. See, the Austin police do not like your pal Reverend here. Mm -mm. They do not. They do not like that I bring the truth to them and I grant no refuge from it. But Lou, I am wrapped in the protection of our almighty God. And each time those agents of Satan think that they have me dead to rights, God sends his judgment to remind them that their laws mean nothing in the face of the Lord. But this time, Lou, oh, this time Satan has inspired them in a way only a crafty monster like himself can create. He has corrupted my former sheep and turned them against me. Carter fell silent and allowed his head to roll from side to side. After several iterations, he stopped and appeared to stare at the floor. Anthony stepped away from Lou and returned to his original position by the table. Lou was still terrified, but having the hulking zealot no longer standing directly behind him brought on relief just the same. Lou was desperately trying to think of something to say or, or do here that might save him or at least buy him some time. As he struggled to find some solution that didn't seem terrible or too obvious, Carter slowly began to lift his head back. Across his face was a sort of frozen grin one would expect to see on the corpse of someone who died very happy about something. His eyes looked vacant, reinforcing the comparison to a corpse. He stared at Lou with glass eyes and that frozen smile for so long that the boy in the chair almost began to scream in panic. That gaze was both dead and very much alive at the same time. Knowing the intentions of the man wearing that expression made matters ex exponentially more horrifying. What could have been mere moments before Luke could stand no more, Carter began to speak once more. See, Lou, last night the Lord sent me yet another test. Much like the in the story of, of Job, God occasionally allows Satan a little room to work. It's no greater test for the sheep than to be tested regularly. But I'm no sheep. I'm a shepherd. The Lord may not feel the need to test me all the time, for my name is written in the book of life, and my seat in heaven is reserved, but Lou... When the Lord flexes his almighty wisdom towards me and feels, feels that a bit of a refresher course is in order, he does not spare me the challenge. My flock was not going to hurt you or that whore witch last night. They were there to remind the witch's father that his time in Austin was over. I had tried to explain to Casper Alexander time and time again that his store was a den of sin. I tried to use the soothing voice of uh, reason and allow the man to gracefully exit. He would not listen, though. No, he wouldn't. However, the little stunt he pulled, with dead bodies and blood all over the streets, where children walk and play, well, well that was his downfall. It takes a great deal of sinning to get those, those fiends of Gomorrah that reside in Austin to do the Lord's work, but you know what they say about giving a man enough rope. Anyway, the Lord strikes like a tactician when he needs to, and we knew that Casper might just open up another one of those uh, smut shops. So we wanted to reinforce the notion to him that it wasn't just his shop the Lord exiled. It was his entire perverted clan. But something went wrong with him. Something went wrong last night, and now one of my former faithful is sitting in a jail cell, giving them heretics the lies they will need to prevent me from serving the Lord. In the corner of his eye, Lou saw Anthony reach into his pocket. In that second, Lou was almost certain that he was reaching for some sort of weapon to execute him. However, it turned out to be a cell phone. Anthony looked a bit concerned, though. The look appeared and vanished. In less than a second, he raised his hand to chest level to get Carter's attention. Sir, it's Brother Philip. He wishes to report something to me. May I please be excused to the back so I can speak with him without disturbing your sermon? Are his ropes and binds sufficient? 
I don't want to have to be put in a position where I must enforce a, a penance on you as I had to Brother Dennis. Ilu had no idea what a penance might be, but a look of real fear and concern suddenly took over the formerly stoic face of Anthony. He briskly walked behind Lou's chair and double-checked his knots. Once he was satisfied, he spoke a low, hushed litany of threats into Lou's ear. Be aware, Woods. I am only stepping into a neighboring room. If you try anything at all, if you so much as sneeze, I'll be out here and I will bring some very real pain with me. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Anthony stepped into the back room and the Reverend resumed his sermon. Now I'm just up to my eyeballs and trying to serve the Lord and dealing with these sinners. And the one time, Lou, the one time I try to simply practice my mercy of the Lord instead of instead of the vengeance. Well, well, then you go and spoil it. You and that little whore of yours. Don't call her that. The word slipped out so quickly that Lou was almost startled at his own reply. He knew this would enrage the man and understood that nothing good could come from it. However, in a moment so brief that he wasn't even aware of it, he became utterly tired of hearing this moron speak. There was no rage, no mixing of emotion as his brother had once described. The very logical fear that he felt still remained as well, but with it came something almost akin to boredom. He didn't care that Carter was clearly insane. He didn't care that he was at this lunatic's mercy. Not in that moment, anyway. In that brief fraction of time, he was sick of hearing this clown trash talk his girl and ramble on and on about what a righteous man of faith he was. The look of stunned animal-like stupidity that fell across Carter's face only served to bring more disgust from Lou. Don't call her what, Lou? Don't call her a whore? She is a whore. My ever-faithful flock witnessed her fornicating with you on a public street where any child could have bore witness. I knew that you were a liar before I had brought you to me, Lou, but I find it amusing that you also are a whoremonger and so proud of it. Lou hoped that his first outburst of defiance would be his last. However, as the Reverend continued to speak, Lou found that he simply couldn't remain silent any longer. You mean when we kissed? Like, listen, man, when people who don't go around kidnapping people in the name of their god meet people they like, you know, kissing is usually a pretty normal course of action. I, so I guess you're too busy serving up the Kool-Aid here to keep up with, with trends, though. And Lou observed Carter's response to his remarks. He believed for a second he might have actually really killed the man, as he'd suggested before, by causing him to keel over from sensory overload. He watched as Carter's face turned to deep red. His mouth was pressed tightly closed, causing him to take on a physical quality that Lou could only describe as, well, Muppet-like. This did Lou no favors as he began to first grin and finally laugh at the thought. Carter balled his fists and placed them at his sides, his arms shaking slightly. His posture was almost like that of a Looney Tunes villain when they get constantly outsmarted and finally throw their hat on the ground and start stomping on it. Carter looked sharply towards the wooden door, clearly wanting Anthony to return so that Lou could be punished or, at this point, possibly murdered. Lou had no desire to hear Carter speak anymore, so he continued on with his verbal disobedience. You know, for a man who claims to know all about me when you pulled me in here tonight, you sure as hell don't seem to understand what I've been through. See, I, I, I've spent the last year absolutely hating myself for things I didn't even cause. My chief complaint was that I simply never spoke up, and that's true. When a, a crooked cop named Williamson stood on the living room of my parents' house and told lie after lie to protect a rich kid and his asshole friends, I didn't say much. I could have done more. I could have I could have called up the Mandeville Police Department. I could have reported Williamson. I, I chose to just stay quiet and accept things as they are. When my mom was sending me off to my aunt's house, I could have just refused. I mean, she wasn't going to physically carry me to the car. 
She she would have been pissed, sure, but in the end, she wouldn't have been able to do anything other than bring my father into the mix. And I, I could have told him to fuck off as well. I might have spent the rest of that summer with no means of entertainment, but at least I would have shown them that I was sick of their crap. Who knows? Things might have might have been might have changed for all of us. On the night my brother murdered my parents, I could have. I could have kept knocking. I could have called the police. Crooked or not, at least Jeff would have been locked away for killing people. He would have probably gotten the mental help that he needed, but I stayed quiet, and now both my parents are dead. I mean, hell, Jeff's probably dead too, and I mean, that's... It's not like, it's not like... They could just walk into a grocery store and buy food, right? And now this. Looks like I'm going to rejoin them sooner than later. And I mean, you seemed like you were probably going to kill me. Even if I sat here and kissed your ass with all your titles and pretentious bullshit. And after this, this little turn of events, I placed my odds of walking out of here alive pretty fucking low. So you know what? If another member of the Woods family has to die, at least I won't die like a sniveling victim. I won't go like my mother or my father begging a fucking, a fucking psychopathic killer for mercy. Mercy, that isn't there. So stop looking around for your fucking ass slave in the other room and just do it. Smite me. Smite me, you asshole. Carter continued his transformation that was as baffling as it was hilarious. His previous sealed mouth was now rapidly trembling, opening and closing so quickly that Lou thought his jaw might unhinge. His hands were no longer balled into fists at his side. Instead, instead they were passing back and forth in front of his thighs, like he was trying to do the Charleston, but had the leg parts wrong. As for his legs, it seemed as though he was almost trying to march in place, but was pretending like he was standing in invisible mud. Lou tried to remind himself that this could just be more show, but he didn't think that was a shred of truth. This man was breaking down. Lou found it hard to believe that he could be the first person confronted by Reverend Carter to stand up to him. Now, someone else would have had to at least once. Maybe Carter gagged most of his other victims. Maybe he never let one of these sermons go on long enough to get this moment. Or maybe Lou's defiance was simply the last straw. After all, one of his own members had flipped out on him rather quickly, and Carter probably knew that prison was on the horizon. With that bit of inspiration... Lou went on. Listen, Reverend. Maybe we could just work something out. Okay, if you... If what you told me is true, that your little pal from last night is giving you over to the cops, you have to know what's next, right? And believe me, if you think New Orleans and Austin are living the Sodom lifestyle, just wait until you get to prison. You call me Reverend in my house. Carter spoke through layers of rage, his mouth still twitching, his body still performing strange dances to no music. No, I don't revere you, so that would be a lie. And we know that you're not a big fan of that. I also think that you're stretching by calling this a house or a church or, well, anything. Just from looking around the insides of this place, the shape of the room and such, I bet, I bet we're in a strip mall, am I right? But you couldn't afford a real church. Nope, you no steeple pews for you. You have to find a failing mini mall with cheap spaces and buy some flimsy chairs. And oh wait, oh that that's that altar. I'll make you a bet right now, Carter. If you remove that white cloth and something besides a cheap card table is underneath it, I will pledge my loyalty to your flock this second. How about it, Rev? Win another soul over for God and shut an annoying teenager up in one move. It's a good deal. Carter began to walk towards the back room, clearly done with waiting for Anthony to finish his phone call. Lou looked around quickly, and perhaps in an actual moment of divine intervention, found what he felt he might just need. It was right on the wall, large as life, simply begging for attention. It was quite faded. Clear effort had been made to remove it, but there it remained. On the wall. Above the altar was the Pay Less Shoes logo. Lou could even see the slogan still written beneath the orange logo. Reverend, please wait a moment. I know I'm well past the point of no return, and I know, and I know that in my life I have sinned. I've also never been shown the true word of God. 
my parents didn't like going to church, at least very often, you know? Maybe that's why God sent my brother to kill him. Might have been God's way of putting me back on the right track by testing me and taking my family from me, like, like Job, right? Carter stopped and slowly began to walk towards Lou. But this time, everything was different. His first entry had been full and flash and show. His stupid strut, the freaky smile, all just part of the good reb's bag of tricks. This time, though, Carter was approaching with an undeniable caution. Even though Lou was a kid tied to a chair in a building with a big oaf just one room away and no one around to hear him call for help, it appeared that Buddy Carter was not just cautious, but maybe even afraid of his hostage. Still, with trembling lips and no trace of the original steel conviction in his tone, Carter spoke. You better not be prepared to disrespect the Bible in my presence, boy. Lou smiled. Of course not, Reverend. You see, I'm a changed kid. I think God has sent you to steer me right. Well, I was blaspheming there a moment ago, allowing the devil to just puppet my words. I looked towards your altar. As I did, I think God gave me a sign. I believe that he wants me to seek guidance from you, Reverend. On a question most important. Carter's eyes were now twitching as well as his mouth, with his hands shaking and knees starting to bend a bit and his feet now rotating back and forth like little windshield wipers. Lou could easily imagine the man as a cartoon yet again. He remembered on all the old cartoons that when a character would run off a cliff, they'd never fall until they looked down. That was where he imagined Carter was at this point. With a voice filled with quivering doubt, Carter said, Ask your question, boy. Reverend, does it feel good to pay less? What followed would never cease to amaze Lou. Carter began to laugh. What shocked the young man tied to the chair was not so much the laughter as he'd already decided that Carter was clearly insane, but rather the genuine joy heard within it. This is not evil laughter or the giggling of a lunatic. It was instead friendly and warm. Lou was quite confused. Brother Anthony stepped into the room. Sir, the police are apparently on their way here. Seems that young woman and her family alerted them after Lou was abducted from their home. I estimate 15 minutes before they arrive. That is fine, brother. Lou, let us make a deal, shall we? What? What? M make a deal? W with you? After what you've just put me and Viviana through? Fuck you! Carter snickered. <laughs> yeah, fuck us all, right? That is the nature of the world today. One fucks another who fucks the next. The whole damn world becomes one massive orgy until all the dicks go limp and all the cunts go dry. Lou was almost in awe at Carter's sudden change of sermon. This man seemed to aim for the epitome of piety a moment ago. Lou, we have a little time to haggle, so I'll just make this short and simple. When the police arrive, you can stagger out in that parking lot as a victim. Cry into their arms as you beg them to protect you from the big bad preacher man. You will go on television, no doubt, where the populace will take pity on you. As your story, coupled with your prior issues in Louisiana will no doubt make you quite pitiful indeed. I'll go to prison, more than likely, and uh, I may even die there. You may continue on as a consummate victim of everything in the world that is stronger than you. You receive sympathy from them. You're rather pathetic and a defenseless victim. Wow, Reverend, you really know how to... Lou began, but Carter cut him off. No time for any more banter, Lou. Here's your other option. When the police arrive, you remain right here. As though you and I had been simply conversing as new friends. 
You'll explain to the police that you encountered me at your friend's home, and I'll tell them that I went there to stop those members of my flock that had broken in and sent her those videos, and I'll invite you back to my church. We spoke for a long time on many issues. I counseled you about your problems back in Mandeville, and you forgave me for allowing my congregation to grow too zealous and slip from my control. You'll appear on television a couple of times where you will tell the world how good of friends you and I have become. Lou began to laugh in spite of his current circumstances. Oh, why would I do that, you crazy old bastard? Carter did not appear upset at the insult. Because, Lou, if you do that, I will pay you one million dollars. She'll say that it is a donation to your betterment while recovering from your struggles. I'll also ensure that your book is published. How do you know, Lou began, never having recalled mentioning this to Carter. How and why no longer matter, Lou. In addition, I'll use my legal connections to grant you emancipation from your aunt and uncle. You'll be a very wealthy, legal adult with a published book under your belt. And as far as your little friend, Miss Alexander, though my church may have hindered her father's work a bit, just imagine what you can do for that family with the financial advantage I'm offering you. This is your chance to finally be a victim no longer. After all, did Randy's family offer you support? Did Williamson's? Has your your own brother come back to assist you? I may be yet another ghoul in your life, but Lou, how many other ghouls have offered to repair you and set you up for greatness? Sir, police have arrived. They're currently exiting their vehicles and approaching the door of the church. Please advise, Brother Anthony stated with a hint of urgency. Carter walked over to Lou and began to release the straps holding him to his chair. Well, Mr. Woods... Time to decide has arrived. Will you be a victim yet again, or are you ready to conquer your life and live the way you desire instead of the way the predators of the sick world demand? Lou felt speechless. He heard the doors of the church open behind him, heard men moving forward, demanding Carter step back. Lou took a deep breath and finally spoke. A week later, photographs of Lou Woods and Reverend Buddy Carter were plastered on newspapers all over Austin. In those pictures, Lou and Carter were shaking hands and smiling. Two weeks later, and Lou was appearing with Carter on several local and a few statewide cable programs. Some of those shows were religious. Some were just the news. But the message was always the same. Lou owed Carter a debt of gratitude for helping him down from the ledge of anxiety and depression caused by his brother's infamous crimes. Carter owed Lou for shining a light on just how far his minions were willing to go. After several months of back and forth with the courts, Carter was found to be not guilty for involvement with his group's illegal activities. In exchange for all this, Lou received wealth that he never believed he'd come close to in his life. His book was written and began to sweep the nation. What was originally meant to be a simple telling of his life with Jeff leading to the murders transformed as more information became public concerning the cover-ups with Maxwell Hayden and other Mandeville city officials. Lou soon found himself a court-ordered legal adult, and with his book sales soaring and his finances vast, he moved away from Texas and found himself in New York. He tried several times to reconnect with Viviana. He wanted to offer her money. He wanted to have her move to New York with him, however, after he'd agreed to flip his testimony to support Carter, she would have nothing to do with him ever again. He received only one reply to his many attempts to contact her. Email from Viviana Alexander to Lou Woods. Lou, you're the worst kind of human. A coward who would throw his friends away to line his pockets. I thought there was so much more to you. I'm grateful that you exposed yourself early, though. At least I didn't waste any real time on you. I will never be able to recover the very real emotions I wasted on you, though. But I can live with that so long as I never see you again. Do not contact me anymore. 
I have blocked you on all media except for this email, which I will delete once I send this to you. V. Alexander Lou remembered wanting to cry that day. Afterwards, though, as the months rolled on and his fame grew, he found that he cared less and less about her opinion. He didn't credit her in his book, and eventually couldn't understand why he ever felt sorry for her at all. She could have come along with him on his journey, but perhaps he wasn't her type after all. She seemed into victims, and that wasn't him at all. Lou, are you listening to those old tapes again? Jessica asked, walking into the apartment with grocery bags hanging from her arms. Lou looked up and was shocked at how much time had passed. Uh, yeah, you know, just admiring your work, I guess. Good boy. I'm glad to hear that you approve, because while I was out, I had the most brilliant idea. Uh-oh. Should I increase my insurance coverage? No, smartass. Just listen. I was thinking since our little friend Jane wanted to piggyback off your time in the sun, perhaps we should return the favor. Jess, what exactly do you have in mind? Well, I was just thinking that maybe it's time we take this little podcast on the road. Hear me out. What if we go over to New Orleans? Mandeville, to be specific. We can do some filming, you know? Just visit some of your old haunts and maybe, just maybe, visit Jane in person. I don't know, Jessica. I haven't been back there since, um, since the incident itself. Then it's high time for a reunion show, if you ask me. And... We do it our own way. No producers, no executives, just the two of us. I mean, come on, Lou, can you imagine what folks will think if you and Jane Arkansas are in the same room together? Do you have a little bit of time to think it over? Sure. I figure by the time I pack our bags and get our flight set up, well, that should give you at least a day to think. Hell, you can think about it on the plane ride down there. You can think about it as we're renting a car. I mean, thinking is free, right, Lou? Lou smiled a bit. So, what you're really saying is that I have no choice in the matter. Lou, don't be silly. You can always choose our hotel, she replied with an impish grin. Lou returned to his living room window and gazed out into the street. He knew that she'd eventually wear him down on this, and fighting it was really pointless. Plus, he wasn't really opposed to the idea of touring his old stomping grounds. Fine, Jessica. We can go. But how in the hell are we going to set up a sit-down with Jane? Oh, Lou. You leave it to me. All you have to do is show up, be the sweet little broken-down victim of circumstance the world loves so much, and now please put my tapes back the way you found them and come help me pack some clothes. Lou did as he was told. And two days later, he and Jessica Lum were boarding a plane destined for New Orleans. A plan in the works to put him and Jane in the same room together to share their experiences. Lou was very nervous about the upcoming days. Jessica, though, had a far more sterile view. To her, this was just another stage of a much larger plan coming together. A plan that even Lou was not aware of. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I just wanted to tell you thank you so much for watching tonight's video, or listening to tonight's podcast on the podcast, if you're listening to that there at Spotify or Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts or wherever you can happen to listen to podcasts. I also want to tell you guys, if you look in the description, there's a lot of really cool things that you can always see down there, including uh, links over to two Creepypasta books that I curated that are available now on Amazon. Check those out. The Creepypasta Collection Volume 1 and Volume 2. They're great for people that like horror, or creepypastas, or people who listen to this podcast. And of course, I wanted to give a big thank you to everyone who checks out patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta and supports the show, keeps the light on, gives me treats for my now two cats, both Hylas and Hercules. Both of them are a handful. And especially a big thank you to Haha Saha, Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Mazakin, Ken Lando Higuchi, Chambinski, Nico Kao, Tristan Pelton, Stephen Van Hus, Chance Burnett, Diana Krause, G. Weevil 3, The Red Oak Shield Virus, Hades Nephew, Carter Barenfanger, Dr. Strawberry, Jordan Wayne Deckard, Bradney Lipe, 
The Government Monitoring System, Anne Charon, Rumble Fox, Acid System, Mike Bullock, Rafael Rodriguez, Dan Sweet, Mad Marshdomp, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Sean Mills, Brian Arce, Cryptic Nightmares, Shadow Morningstar, Somber Puppet, Brianna Wright, Someone You Love, Said the King 56, Bad Honey, S-Man, Kiri the Sloth, Patrick Schoolmeister, Thomas Burgett, Barbara Maceo, Bobby Carmen, Liam Newman, The Homeless Bird 93, Sky Harbor, Caleb Dougal, Last Blade Song, Eliminator 86, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, and Corey X Kenshin. A big thank you to all of you guys and everybody down there in the description. I really can't thank you guys enough for supporting the show. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And everybody who listens, sweet dreams. <laughs>